Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of the Chosen Ones Star Wars podcast here on Game Domain. I am your host, Jason, along with my co-host, Captain. Captain. Hello there. Um, so today we have a uh, very interesting video because right now there isn't really that much Star Wars news going around. So we figured we want to get you guys another podcast out. We said we're going to try to do every two weeks and uh, we're going to have one this week, which is obviously this episode. And then we're going to have one next week, which is going to be a preview of the Clone Wars season seven, which comes mm. out in around two weeks. I know Captain's very excited about that, just as Hell's I am. Yes. <laughs> and we are going to be bringing you guys weekly reviews of those shows, hopefully after um, we just have to work out the timing on when the uh, episodes are going to release of the show and then when we'll be able to record the podcast and what day of the week we'll be able to get that out to you on. Um, so for this episode, we thought we'd do something fun and we're going to um, go into our rankings of the Star Wars movies. Unfortunately, um, Leo and ricky will both not be with us tonight it'll it's just going to be um me and captain which uh captain i mean you know only two there are no more no less so i think this um i think this is going to work out well uh following the sith tradition uh led by darth bane and, and um, we shall reveal ourselves to the jedi yes. cast we shall have revenge the one of the 26 words that um Ray Darth Parks Maul. as Darth Maul yeah. <laughs> in the entire episode one. And still um, the most badass character. Yeah, definitely. Just like Boba Fett. Boba Fett what, said what, like five things, but he sold the most action figures. So yeah. he gets all the popularity. Um, so we're basically just going to go in where um, Captain is going to give his 11th ranked Star Wars movie. Oh, by the way, we are including the Skywalker saga as well as the... Um, Star, Star Wars, Wars stories. stories, which are just Solo and Rogue One. Um, no TV shows included in here. No, nope, we're not putting um, on that weird Christmas special. That's not going anywhere near us. <laughs> that does not count. And the Clone Wars movie does not count as a real movie. We're only doing live action movies here. That movie is yeah. horrible. And also it doesn't even belong on the list because it's not live action. So You know, you know um, that whole thing where the apprentice kills the, the master? Yeah. Yeah, you just said you don't like the Clone Wars animated movie. Uh, just, just, just basically keep your eyes open, man. <laughs> I mean, I love the TV show, but the animated movie, I think it has like a 17 on uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, and I think that might be a worthy um, uh, rating. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to get into it, and it's going to be 11 movies, the nine Skywalker Saga movies, and the two um, Star Wars stories. Um, so basically how, the, how it's going to be formatted is Captain is going to give his 11th movie, I'm going to give my 11th movie, Captain's going to give his 10th movie, then I'm going to give my 10th movie, and so on. So Captain, why don't you start off with the shocking reveal of your worst ranked Star Wars movie? Well, it is absolutely obvious, and I'll give people at home a good three seconds to type in the chat, uh, not the chat, but the comments, exactly what the worst Star Wars movie ever made was. Uh, one two three oh it's obviously the last jedi uh, i don't I, I i do not like any of the new star wars movies I, they've got good points but it's more bad than good so i'm just kind of like eh, whatever but the last jedi out of all three of them was just the because we'd been introduced to we'd been introduced to luke skywalker for like three seconds and then he just tosses the lightsaber and even luke himself was like no, like Mark Hamill was like, no, he's the most, you know, optimistic person in the universe. He'd be like, he'd grab onto that lightsaber and power up like Goku and fly off and just immediately fly through Star Killer Base and destroy it. That's what should have happened, even though Star Killer Base would be gone. But yeah, he would have taken on, you know, everything. It didn't matter the risk to himself. He would have been like, let's do it, mate. Let's form a new rebellion. Let's fist fight, you know, General Hooks, the little ginger prick. And, you know, the Last Jedi really didn't have anything to it. It was a rehash, like most of the new movies, uh, were a rehash of the previous movies. So, you know, a giant battle on a white planet. Ooh, where's that come from? And obviously, a lot of the stuff that I'm saying is cliche. Um, all of the, <laughs> the points I bring up are exceptionally cliche because there's only three good parts of that movie. The first one is the Millennium Falcon flying through the inside of uh, Crate because it, it brings back a very beautiful piece of music. The interior design of the crystal like planet structure is beautiful. So I was like, yeah, that's good with that. Um, Mark Hamill just stood there after it's, it's, it's so much blaster fire has been poured onto his face and then just 
brushes his shoulder off like, mm hmm what are you going to do about it? Beautiful. And then, of course, even though no one would choose this, the bit where the guy licks, and I'm pretty sure it was the director or someone, but licks the floor. Yeah, I think it was the goes, director of Rogue One, I think. Yeah, but yeah. like touches the floor and goes, salt. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Mm, the tears of so many people coming to have <laughs> made this planet. But yeah, there was there was no real story to it. There was no real anything to it really. It was a it was like a filler episode of Dragon Ball Z. It just turned up, happened, it was all pointless and you know it was it was necessary to the story, but it was pointless to the franchise because it informed nothing it was basically one director saying fuck you to another director and then the other director came back for the other movie so like what's the point it was it was a pointless movie in fact they should go back and they should reshoot episode five <laughs> just get it over with and make it like they should have i'm not going to get into some but yeah no the the last jedi is my least favorite uh, no is my most hated and my least favorite <laughs> uh because it's literally just a filler episode all right, so now I will get into my 11th ranked Star Wars movie or my least favorite Star Wars movie, or just as you said, my most hated Star Wars movie. Um, I'm in the same exact boat as you with The Last Jedi. Now, I do disagree with some of the stuff you said, but completely agree with most of it. Now, I do believe that there is a significant story throughout this movie, but like you said, it is almost completely unnecessary by the way that it kind of scraps. Every, it, and it's not even so much the – like I have no issue with Rey being a nobody, and I have no issue with – them killing Snoke. I believe that was critical to Kylo's development as a character. But the main thing to me is how they treated Luke Skywalker. Ryan Johnson is a fantastic director. I, mm. I don't think anything poorly of Ryan Johnson because of what he did with this movie. I think he had a vision. I completely didn't agree with his vision, but that was his vision and that and that was his movie. He was you know, tapped on the shoulder by Kathleen Kennedy to direct this movie, and that's what he's getting paid to do. He's not paid to please us, but that's what he's doing. Now, yeah, I think the, that was the main thing. They were yeah. paid to make movies, not yeah. to work with the audience. Yeah, and now I do believe The Force Awakens set up a lot of things. Um, the Last Jedi kind of got rid of those things. Um, they didn't utilize Phasma at all. Who, I mean, it wasn't going to be the next Boba. But she could have been something. She could have been a good character. But just like they did in The Force Awakens, but you know, they kept telling us, oh, she's going to be in The in the Last Jedi so much more than she was in The Force Awakens. But she just completely wasn't. She was barely in the movie at all and then just gets the, – the only reason to have her even in the movie is to fulfill Finn's character arc. And then – which also involves Rose Tico, who – I mean I know you didn't talk about, but probably – I mean I don't think I dislike her as a character, not the actor. I'm not going to go and attack Kelly Marie Tran for how the the um, character was written. She did a great job playing the character, but I just don't believe in anything the character did. The whole Canto bite sequence was probably the most useless 30 minutes of any Star Wars movie ever. Mm -hmm. Even people that I know who absolutely love the movie, and I know a lot of people who love and you know to their credit that i'm glad that they love the movie i wish i could have loved it as much as them when i walked out of the theater seeing it opening night but that entire scene that entire sequence people who love the movie tell me that they skip through it when they're watching the movie again it's because it's just completely useless i mean you go to find a the, the only person in the galaxy right maz kanata who's had no point in the movie either other than just showing up to tell them this. It could have been any other character, but they just throw Maz in here and she just tells them that there's one person in the galaxy who can do this. They go, they can't get that one person. And then they happen to be in the cell with the other person in the galaxy who yeah, magically just random happens to know, yeah, who randomly knows how to do. Um, I also completely didn't, I don't even remember his name, but Benicio del Toro's character. I mean, when they announced him, I was like, Ooh, maybe he's going to be like a cool Sith Lord or something. Maybe something behind Plagueis. I mean, uh, not Plagueis, Snoke, but, then they just complete. I mean, his character, but the stuttering. I mean, it just completely wasn't needed. I mean, the whole Canto bite scene was a complete waste. Now, I liked some of the stuff on Octo, but I mean, the 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 cinematography of of the of the whole movie. Beside, I'm I'm not a big fan of the CGI for Crate. I think it looks very outdated and very fake. Like, I mean, I'm I. This might be an exaggeration, but I honestly think some of the stuff in the prequels looks better than what they did on Crate. I really didn't like how the whole Crate scene looked. Um, I mean, when when Finn. When Rose knocks away um, Finn's speeder at the end of the battle on Crate, and um, you know says that quote, um, you know, uh, 
I forgot, I forgot the exact quote, but, uh, like save the ones that you love, don't fight what you hate. But that's exactly what he was doing was sacrificing himself to save everybody behind him and save the one he loved. But then, and you know, miraculously somehow he can drag her all the way across to the, <laughs> to, the yeah. to the base without any first order person thinking to shoot them. But, um, the cinematography of the movie, especially the stuff on Octo, I mean, was just comp- absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. And, but, then it all like for me though my main this the main thing I dislike about this movie all stems from Luke and I know you know we don't have that much time so I'll just quickly go through this but Luke is my favorite character in all of Star Wars besides R two D two I will say that he's my favorite human of Star Wars yes but um I mean Luke is just like you said he's the most optimistic person in the galaxy I mean you have somebody Obi Wan Kenobi and Yoda two of the most powerful Jedi's ever two people who you know, kept telling Anakin to not tap into the dark side, but they're basically telling Luke, like, you know, you have to kill him. You can't save him. You can't save your father. Yeah. But yet, and he says, there's good in him. I can't, there's never one moment where he says, all right, you're, I have to kill my father. And then thinks about it. And then, you know, double, uh, thinks about it again. And then second guesses himself. He, from the beginning says, there's no way I can kill my father. There's still good in him. Once he, once he, um, believes the, the revelation that he, that, vader is in fact his father he completely from the beginning says that he will not kill him and then yet he sees a little bit of dark in his in his nephew and he goes in and tries to kill him i mean it just completely doesn't make sense they almost take luke's character and make him like a bad bad character for like like a bad-hearted character for no reason you kind of invert him don't you yeah now the one thing that i will give the movie some credit as to how they as how ryan now in my opinion i think the reason why ryan johnson did this with luke is because how jj abrams set it up is that luke didn't want any part of anything that was going on in the galaxy he went to this island to never be found again and to die just like he says in the last jedi so from a ryan johnson standpoint to have him say oh yeah, you know what? I was wrong. I'm going to take this lightsaber and I'm going to come with you and we're going to go destroy the rest of the galaxy. It wouldn't have necessarily made that much sense, but that again falls on Kathleen Kennedy, not Ryan Johnson, but that falls on Kathleen Kennedy for not having a plan for the entire trilogy because you have J.J. Abrams set something up that didn't really work with how they set it up of Luke being far away on the island by himself and Ryan Johnson, as much as I disagreed with what he did, he didn't really have a choice because it would have looked very cliche like, oh really? If he just came back and and fought them, which I would have liked a lot better, but would have had a lot more criticism um, from a, a movie and quality of picture standpoint not just from the fan base but yeah so overall i mean i we said a lot of the same stuff but the last jedi it's just certainly not Mm -hmm. a movie that i like and i mean i hate to say that i dislike it or maybe even hate it and i wouldn't say this about any other star wars i really think that it's down that path and i've tried to like it i've probably watched it at least five times since it came i watched it three times in theaters didn't i liked it worse each time i saw it in theaters and every time i watch it at home i don't like it i don't um, dislike it more. I just can't find any liking to this movie, except the one. The quickly before uh, we move on, the one thing that I like from this movie, the one thing actually happens to be in my top five favorite Star Wars moments or scenes of all time is when Luke goes on to the Falcon, and then R two powers on, and and you have that little <laughs> guilt trips in, and then yeah, and then R two sends the um sends out the hologram with. Um, the transmission of Leia, which I think was also very touching just because of, you know, of course, of Carrie Fisher and, you know, she passed mm-hmm. away before the movie came out. So it made that moment a lot more emotional. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely The Last Jedi, rightfully at the bottom of both of our lists. So now, Captain, do you want to yes. go into your number 10 choice, which I completely disagree with you on, but, you know, give, give well, your you take. Disagree with you on, but obviously people would have been able to guess that if The Last Jedi was the top of what I hate the most, then obviously The Rise of Skywalker is right after it. (laughs) Oh, God, The Rise of Skywalker. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know where they were going. I don't know how they thought they could get away with it, but apparently they managed to do it somehow. And I think it all stems down to the fact that they, they had absolutely no idea of what to do with three of the main characters. And that's Paul, Ray, <laughs> and uh and, and Finn. They had no idea what to do with them. It's literally you've you've got to have a mission for them to properly get into. And they didn't have a proper mission, but instead had a bunch of side quests. 
it was literally go fetch this. Oh, we fetched this. What's this do? Oh, it reveals the location of another thing we've got to go fetch. Oh, we fetched this thing now. Oh, we've got to go to this location and like stall for a little bit, and then reinforcements are going to turn up. Oh, then what's going to happen? Oh, then we're just going to immediately win. And I'm like, right. <laughs> where's the story? Where's the plot? De- where's the character development? Poe's entire thing through this movie is almost gets laid. That is literally <laughs> Poe almost getting laid is his entire character arc in this movie. That luck tur- at the end of the movie. Yeah, he turns up. He, you know, he's like, oh, what we're we gonna do? And then he's like, gonna go do this with Ren. And he's like, right, okay. So he's at this minute, he's not really a main character. He's a side character. And then he gets to the point where he meets the weird woman um, on the on the planet, which I can't remember the name of the planet, but he meets her on this planet, and she's like, I'm going to kill you. And he's like, don't kill me. And she's like, all right. And I'm like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you were going to kill him. No, you're not going to kill him. Okay. And then right at the end, everyone's like making out and hugging and stuff. And then he just looks <laughs> over her and he goes, you... you this you want you want to get you know pulled do you and she's like nah that's it that's his entire it, like that's his character arc yeah finn's character arc is he turns up and he's like ray i want to bang you and she's like ah mate i'm too busy doing a side quest at the minute okay, we can't <laughs> that's it and then he meets another stormtrooper who because kathleen kennedy is a woman and believes that the force is female <laughs> Though it is not, the force is simply an entity that exists throughout the universe that binds us together. It, yes. it penetrates us in a way, I guess you could say. Uh, and you know, it's it's it doesn't have a gender, Kathleen Kennedy. But yeah, no, yes. it's it's a woman. So obviously, the leader of the other stormtroopers is the wokest thing you could possibly have gone for <laughs> a black woman. I have no problem with the actress. I have no problem with anything. It's literally just. Oh yeah, no. There's a bunch of other stormtroopers that ret- uh, that you know ran away because you know we deserted because of you, Finn. Oh, by the way, I was I'm just in charge now for no reason whatsoever. Like it would have been nice to see something on the people on the remaining stormtroopers that signified yeah, because, that they kept their rank. Yeah, that would have been a very interesting plot point because people have said for the long time that as 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 I do kind of like Ray overall as a character, but a lot of people said that. Finn having a stormtrooper who left the first, like who left, yeah. who ran away from everything via stormtrooper, and have him being force sensitive and being a Jedi, and like the whole trilogy being about his motives and why he did that, and discovering that he, you know, he could be a Jedi. That would be one of the sickest plot points in all of Star Wars. And even like the same thing with like what they had with yeah, all those yeah. ex stormtroopers. If you do something with that or build off of that, that would have been a really, really cool plot point. But well, it, 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 it would have been better if halfway through this movie it turned out that the entire trilogy had been about Finn. That would have been that would have been like a big plot twist, and I would have been like, yeah. "Yes, that's very good." But like Ray's character arc is she is a giant child. Mm. For this movie, she is a giant child, which is perfectly uh, shown off in the scene where Kylo Ren meets her on top of the Death Star after she's just fallen through a door that you know it leads into like a sith dimension i guess yeah because there is uh, there is absolutely nothing she she opens a door in a wall right and it's like the, it's like the cave on dagobah it's you know it's got the dark side in it but technically she she would have stepped right out of the throne room and fallen off the giant tower because that wall is not a wall that leads to a place if you because in episode six you can see how what the tower where the emperor sits is yeah that 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 wall leads into space so she would have said it's magical Sith doorway powers and stuff. So I'm like, oh, okay, the Sith do have weird, wacky magic technology and stuff. But then when she comes out, she falls out backwards. Kylo picks up the thing and literally her entire dialogue is, give it me, give it me, it's mine. I want it, give it me, me, me. <laughs> so I'm just kind of like, oh, okay. And then obviously they go to the greatest named planet in existence, Testicle. Uh, I mean, <laughs> they got to exit, and yeah, I'm just like, okay, so what's going on here? And uh, then they don't explain just which version of the, of the Emperor we're seeing, and then you know, Kylo just you know kills the Backstreet Boys, then dies himself, and I'm like, right, so basically, I just sat here for three hours to and get something watched that you expected. Nothing. <laughs> I I literally just watched some guy's fanfic. Of eventually <laughs> Ray, Ray and and, and uh, Kylo getting together, and then at the end he just dies. I'm like, what? Yeah. I don't, why? Why does he die? Why does any? Why does any of this happen? Why does the Emperor 
shooting lightning at a lightsaber, a C2 lightsabers, and go, oh, no, this will defeat me now. I'm like, what? You're, 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 my mind was literally melted watching this movie because none of it made sense. <laughs> Therefore, though not as bad, because it did have some nice parts in it, especially the fact that the general who runs the First Order is called Pride, and as soon as he died, I went, mm, yes, twice the Pride, double the Fall. <laughs> that, was, that was very nice. So the fact that you know the Sith Troopers are pretty dope... Um, don't know why Star Destroyers have planet killer weapons the size of just a big cannon. That made no sense. Should have explained that. There was a lot of different things, but it was just a big fetch quest. And a lot of people have said that. And it's bang on the nose because it's literally mm. go to this place, go to this place, go to this place, go to this place. Go, and that's like the first hour of the movie. And you can't have that as a first hour in a movie. Just look at, like, in fact, just look at episode four. How long do we spend on Tatooine? A good half of the movie? Mm hmm. And we're just in one location going, oh, my parents have been killed by stormtroopers. We've got amazing aim for some reason. And then these Jawas, oh, killed by stormtroopers because they've got amazing aim for some reason. <laughs> just don't have any good aim. But yeah, they it, it, it would have made the 11th spot if the fact that The Last Jedi was nothing than a filler arc. And yeah. I might actually at some point have to bump it up to share the same spot because of the ending of uh, the Rise of Skywalker, which is hi, I, I'm I'm Ray, Ray Skywalker, and I'm like, no, you're not. You're yeah, Palpatine. <laughs> I, it would have been very cool if she just embraced being a Palpatine and you know changed the last name into something good. So now, um, do you have anything else to touch on, or should I go into my number ten? Uh, I, I think that if I was to touch on any more, I would most likely end up drowning myself. Uh, so, <laughs> you, you move on to yours because I like the the movie you got at ten. I like. Yeah. So like like exactly. If I'm not mistaken, I believe your number ten is my number six, and my number ten is your number six. So we kind of have a flip flop in this spot. That so is true. um, uh, my number ten might be a shock to most of you watching out there, and it has nothing to do with the quality of the movie because um, and I was telling Captain uh while we were in chat before the show, um, if it was a greatest Star Wars movie ranking or and my favorite, the two list would be completely different. I mean, this movie that I have at number ten is a movie that I would probably say maybe even cracks the top five in best like well made Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. But Definitely. in my opinion, I just don't have any attachment to it, and therefore it finds itself in the number ten spot. And that is Rogue One. Now, Rogue One: A Star Wars Story is a movie that I enjoy because it's Star Wars, but is a movie that I really don't. When I'm sitting and watching through the Star Wars movies, and I get to Rogue One. I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. I guess I'll just watch it because I have to. It's almost like it's more of a chore than me actually sitting down to enjoy watching it. Now, I, I mean, the if the Vader scene wasn't at the end, I would probably like this movie a lot less because that scene is just one of the sickest scenes in all of Star Wars, mm. and that's pure Darth Vader. Everything that we ever wanted to see him like. But the whole movie, I mean, I think the movie has a strong plot. Like I said, I mean, the movie's a well-made movie, beautifully shot. The you know, the whole Scarif sequence is amazing. The space battle, uh, you know, the space battle above Scarif is one of the Scarif is one of the best space battles in all of Star Wars. I mean, it has that original trilogy feel, but with new CGI, and it just looks absolutely fantastic. But I, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily one of my favorite. I like the movie because every movie from here on up I like. The the you know, I like it uh minimally. And then, you know, as we get to the top, I start to like the movies more and more, and then I love them. But this movie just doesn't really have anything that makes me say, Oh, you know, oh, this is one of my favorite Star Wars movies. The characters the characters are all right. I like Jin. I never really got attached. I mean, my favorite part of this movie is seeing the cameos, like, you know, when R2 and 3PO pop up and then yes. when um Jimmy Smith's comes out as Bail Organa, like that, you know, that makes me happy. Or Mon Mothma, you know, the actor who played her in episode three, who happens to look exactly like the original actor. Very I don't freaky. know how. It, it's it's incredibly freaky. It's like they're doppelgangers. Um, and yeah, like, like I said, all the cameos and the like Vader at the end. And then, I mean, the Tarkin CGI stuff was, it was, eh, but 
uh, the cameos were with my best with the best part to me. I mean, it, it's also we were talking about like the story of the Last Jedi being unnecessary. I mean, this movie I liked it and I liked the fact that they made it, but also this story. I mean, it really is completely unnecessary because it's one of the things that we didn't really need because it was always a mystery as to you know what happened right before Episode Four. How did they get the Death Star plans? And I liked that they wanted to go into that, but it just didn't really work for me to say like, oh, I love this movie and I absolutely, you know, I have an attachment to this movie. But like I said, it's a very good movie. And if I had to say the greatest Star Wars movies, it'd probably be seven, six, or maybe even in the top five. But um, in my opinion, I just don't, you know, it's definitely not one of my favorites. So um, with that being said, we'll move on to Captain's uh, number nine, which we both have a commonality in our number nine choice, just as we did with number 11. So why don't you go ahead? Well, this uh, obviously people have clocked on by now exactly what's happening. It's the Farce Awakens, and I'm calling it the Farce Awakens because it is <laughs> a massive farce. This, this, I don't know what they were thinking. So, it it exists here because it had a strong, right, it had a strong opening. It had a very strong opening with I, yeah, I do agree with that. With the way like they sh- the way they set up Finn, the way they set up Poe, the way they set up Kylo. Very good. The fact that Kylo can stop blast bolts with his brain. Just completely badass. I mean, uh, yeah, right, and right from that, the get That was woof. I mean, and, I don't care if somebody says, oh, we've never seen a Sith do that before. You know, no, how can yeah. they do that? I mean, that, was, that, just all the time. I mean, yeah, and we've seen we've seen Vader absorb blaster bolts into his mechanical Into his hand, so, literally. Yeah, let yeah, let, so. let um, Kylo stop so the I'm, blaster I'm, bolt. I'm, yeah, I'm perfectly – and I was like, those are badass. Seeing the fact that a stormtrooper – every other stormtrooper around him is just blasting kids and all this kind of yeah. stuff and just mass murdering this village and he's like wait a minute we shouldn't be doing this and then he, you know he takes off his helmet and phasma's like mate put your helmet back on i didn't tell you to take it off you're disobeying orders and then you know the, they set all then they set up this thing of you know it's a good setup and then nothing happens to the point where the they, they're just like star killer base has blown up um the New Republic planets and like, oh, yeah, right, which we had no, which we had no relation to. What? Yeah, we like they had that. It shows the planets be destroyed, and it zooms in on that woman who I swear to God is Martha Jones from Doctor Who. <laughs> I swear it is that woman, right? But it like all the it zooms in on her, and I'm like, all right. And then she just blows up, and I'm like, well, I'm never gonna find out yeah, now. No, like, no, we never vaporized. Even... But, I mean, you know, even, they could have done. They could have went into some of the politics of the New Republic. You know, through the first half of the movie, they could have had something. They could have had Leia with them or whatnot. I mean, obviously, they saved the Leia reveal to the end, which was or not to the end, but towards the end of the movie with Han coming out and then 3PO butting in. But that was a touching moment. But if they would have, you know, a lot of people say that the prequels had politics and politics in Star Wars could be really cool if done right. I think the politics in the prequels was was done decently, not amazing, but done decently because I am a prequel fan. But um, they could have very well knowing what they know now about like what fans didn't like about the prequels they could have easily executed um like amazing star wars politics by going into this in the sequel well, they, all, they all, we, all we needed in the movie was 15 minutes max of what was happening on that planet and i don't mean yeah, just the minutes. state of the new republic and the yeah. chancellor that's it and i don't i don't mean 15 minutes back to back i mean like part way through the story just jump to them going oh yeah no the first order is coming around and they've been doing all this yes. kind of stuff and what we're going to do about it and you know try and and then you know just general hooks is like i'm ginger so watch me blow up the first order i'm like well, okay yeah. um so yeah and then just the point in the movie where they're like look there's this star killer base on that big holographic table there's a star killer base. yeah and then this, and this is, is the, the second death star, death star. Yeah. this is the first death star and he's just like right so it's just another death star and it's like yeah but it's bigger <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's it is. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what they did. All, all you have to do is once again go through a little I, hole and blow I something don't up. Know, I don't know what. And like you know, it was funny that you know, oh, we can't penetrate it because it's made out of metal. And I'm like, okay. Whatever. And 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 in the Star Wars visual um, visual dictionary, they they show Star Killer Base and they confirm that it is the planet Ilum from the Clone Wars that we see, where that's all all the Jedi's go to to get their kyber crystals because that's yes. how the powers. That's how the planet was powered. And you have a – I mean you have a real planet like that, and I know it's now more mechanical more mechanical now than man, you know, like the uh, quote from Obi-Wan, but more machine now than man. But the planet is basically a machine now, but it's still 
I mean, the basis of it, I mean, obviously we see that it's like an ice forest. So it still has the climate of Ilum and everything that Ilum had, because that's how they get the kyber crystals from the caves. But so then how is it all of a sudden able to just be completely blown up? It doesn't make any sense. It's a planet and it's just completely blown up that well, easily. It's not like the Death Star where it's all like, where it's, you know, completely made it. it that, uh, that part, you know, made me a little skeptical. It didn't really resonate with me. Well, it, I do understand how they blew it up. They basically because there was an entire sun with inside the center of the planet. Yeah, and the, shut yeah, down. And, yeah, so they just shut down this containment field, and then the sun was like, "Mate, gravity." And I'm like, "Right, okay." But it's like they turn up, they do some pew pew, and then <laughs> and I, I'm by the way, people are like, "This guy has no idea what he's talking about." I'm simplifying it because I don't like these movies. So yeah, so, you just like, want to get through it. I just want to get them over with. But you know, Paul turns opening. Uh, well, okay, let's not even talk about the fact that they light speed through an energy shield. Yeah, right. I don't. And I don't care what people get say. Right up into the, uh, right, right yeah. up onto the surface. I, I don't care what people say. If you were to approach a energy shield, right? So it's it's a, it's a literal manifestation of energy around the planet. Yeah, the, the speed the ship of light, should blow up just like it did in the last Jedi. It, 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 it went. No, all this, the way. It would. You would literally hit it, and that's it. <laughs> You'd be dead because light is both, you know, particles yeah. and waves. You're still going to touch something. You don't magically disappear on. Whatever. I'm not even going to get into that. The one thing I will, but so yeah, so you know, it's like, oh no, what we're going to do? It's just, it's just another Death Star. All right. Well, what did they do in the first one? Well, they flew down a trench, uh, and viewed it a little bit, and then it blew up. And I'm like, right, okay. And then Finn's like, yeah, I used to work sanitary on the on the place, but I know the entire battle <laughs> station the entire. layout. And I'm like, <laughs> what? You you basically clean toilets as a stormtrooper, but. Some, what did you just walk in and download the plans or memorize the plans <laughs> or something like that? Did you did, were you cleaning the floor and went, Oh, look, it's the plans to the Star Killer base. Better learn them just in case I get promoted. No, so he's like, Yeah, no, there's a giant, there's a giant square right here that if you blow it up, uh, the entire thing will blow up. And I'm like, mm, They make sense, you know, shut down the thing that holds the sun in place to fire, it blows up the planet. And then they turn up and they, you know, they pew pew a little bit more, uh, and oh, we can't damage it. It can only be damaged from the inside. And I'm like, well, good job. A bunch of people flew onto that planet, isn't it? <laughs> At the speed of light. And we're not going to explain how they managed to travel through an energy shield. But And then they just blow it up. And I'm like... Yeah. Definitely, definitely cliche. It was... It was it, you know what? It was more cliche than actually being cliche. <laughs> so, um... I don't really have too much else to say because i kind of agree with everything that you said i mean i'll just quickly say i I, like like i said with rogue one i mean i i think the movie's a good movie i just don't necessarily like it that much um i think it's set up decently besides the whole luke thing i said i think everything else set up kind of nicely for how ryan johnson was supposed to pick it up and make a good movie in episode eight but obviously we know what happened there but um i mean I like the introduction of Snoke. I mean, we, you know, all Sith are these shadowy figures who we know nothing yes. about. Right. So when people say, oh, we need to. I mean, Palpatine at one point was that guy. Right. Palpatine at one point was that guy. I mean, you look in episode five when Palpatine shows up. I mean, if you've ever seen the original theatrical release of episode five, where it's the old actor with like the, the, the monkey eyes or whatever, that freaky looking Palpatine. Yeah. And he shows up. And then when he shows up as Ian McDermott in episode six, we have no clue who he is. We have nothing about his backstory until we get the prequels. So that's something that's a mystery. So then when people say, you know, they're complaining and then, you know, we need to know something about Snoke. What The Force Awakens and what J.J. Abrams did is like set up exactly how a Sith should be set up. Darth Maul. We knew nothing about. He was just a mysteriously shadowy figure, you know, the Phantom Menace, exactly how Palpatine was. Um, I mean, Duke was a little different because we found out immediately that he was once a Jedi. But, I mean, with Snoke, it just sets it up like a typical Sith. That was well done. And then they, I think they set up all the characters nicely. You set up Finn nicely. You set up, I mean, Poe wasn't really in the movie that much, but then you could have just taken him and used him a lot in episode eight instead of having him running around and, you know, being like a bambling idiot just because he's a white male. So they have to have the woman, you know, more powerful and smarter mm-hmm. than him because the force is female. And then, um, but yeah, so it's, it's set up things nicely. The movie itself was good, but like, like I, like, like I said, with Rogue One, I just don't really have much personal attachment to it. I mean, I like the callbacks and, and all the um, all the nostalgia. But other than nostalgia, the whole movie is just episode four redone. It it's is. just episode four reskinned. So, I mean, to me, it doesn't really – it's nothing new. It's nothing special. 
And, you know, part of the reason why I like Rise of Skywalker a lot and obviously a lot more than you is because I think that J.J. Abrams – I mean you I'm, you disagree with me on this obviously, but I think J.J. Abrams tried to do stuff that's like really, really new and that we really haven't seen before and kind of just completely turned things around, which I do respect and which I did think worked out pretty well in the end. But like with Force Awakens, I mean you have, you have Force Awakens where everyone said to J.J., you know, you basically remade the same movie. And then the, the Rise of Skywalker and everyone said, holy shit, what is this? This is nothing like we've ever seen before. It's the most Star Wars-y Star Wars movie ever. So um, but yeah, I, I like what J.J. did overall. But you know, just like I said with Rogue One, I mean I have a lot of the same criticisms that you have. And then just like I said with Rogue One, I just don't really have any attachment to it whatsoever. I'm not a big no, fan. No, I, I, so, I, I just couldn't get invested in it. Yeah. In any so now, now um, move on to number eight. And so you'll start with your number eight. See, number eight for me, and I, people will probably hate me for saying this. Uh, it's the Phantom Menace. Mm. And you it, are a bald one. I am a bald one, and the only reason the Phantom Menace is here is, I think, because it it tries too hard. So you know, we had questions for episode four, five, and six of like, "What is the Force?" It's yeah. only been told to us about. You it know, tries to only... answer every single one of it, those questions. Yeah, it tries to, you know, ex- it tries to put too much on you at once, and to be honest, doesn't really explain any of it to the point where the joking version, uh, bad lip read, where Qui Gon says it's heroin, is far more of a decent experience <laughs> than. Yeah, so it, it, it uh, the only it, literally the only reason it is here is because it tries too hard. I love the Phantom Menace. I love the the uh, I love all. Of, I love episode one, two, three, four, five, and six, and you know some of the stuff in between. But the only reason here is because it tries too hard. It had it had a really good plot. Okay, it had a yeah. good plot. It had a good story, it had good characters. Sure, it did draw on a little bit when they were like on Tatooine. You, some stuff you didn't really need, and I think it was because they had the technology to now do funky stuff uh, that they were like. They right, definitely relied a lot on CGI. Yeah, we're gonna try some stuff out because you know we have we have better computer technology now than we did when I made it with you know sticks and and yarn and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, right, okay, no worries on that, George Lucas. I'll I'll accept. And I did like the fact that quite a lot of it was still in fact practical. Like uh the city of Thede, that's practical. The waterfalls that you see in Thede are made of salt. It's a very old practical effect trick to make it look like real water. That was like that's pretty cool for all the waterfalls yeah. and stuff. I was like, yeah. And where the I don't know where they filmed in Thede. I don't uh I don't know if I think it was, it was uh, Italy. It was Italy. That yeah. I, I would Italy, definitely... Italy and Spain. There was like I a would... castle in Spain and a cat and something in Italy. I would definitely go to those locations because they're oh, exactly. exceptional, yes, for sure. exceptionally beautiful. I like the fact that it's it it sets up the Clone Wars without yeah. even, you without you knowing that the Clone with Wars is the next yeah, the Wars happen. It sets it all up. Sure, we see a very weird trick, and we I'm pretty sure with Darth Maul when he kills um, Qui Gon Jinn, we see this weird kind of close quarters fighting with with yeah. with lightsaber hilts, not with lightsabers, which yeah. is kinda of weird. I was like, okay. Um but it also introduced us to the first Grey Jedi, which is Qui Gon Jinn, which is a guy who accepts his emotions and doesn't yeah. try to hide them. And is also you know, he's like, No, we've got to do Jedi this. We, we've got to do this good stuff. And you know, and Obi Wan's like, that's why you're not on the council master. And he's like, Yeah. I don't care. As long as Idiot, we do yes, what man. the force wants and you know help keep balance and stuff and i'm like he was probably one of the greatest jedi because he was like don't bother getting in politics or anything like that. i just focus yeah. on the force and do the good stuff and i'm like that's jedi and mm. they're just like yeah but what about the droid attack on the wookies and i'm like wait a minute that's two movies <laughs> from now what are you doing for it but yeah the only reason it's here is it drones on a little bit too much they try and throw in too much at once with you know like politics and setting up anakin's origin story and and you know, they're bringing in the Sith for the first time in like hundred odd years or whatever and they just literally they make this giant Scooby-Doo sandwich that they can't eat <laughs> because physics is applied and you can't stretch your mouth that far that's the only reason that the Phantom Menace is at 8 for me is because there's just too much within not enough of a time there is about two movies worth of information thrown into a single movie of like two hours and something odd minutes so that's the only reason it's at 8 is because it's just too much. 
Um, yeah, so my I think our eight and seven are flipped just like um Yes, they are ten and six. So now I have a number eight. For first of all, I just want to say before I get into my number every movie from here on out, I can say that I like a lot if not love yep. within uh, as a star wars movie so we're, we're going to be i'm probably going to be praising more than criticizing but any criticisms we give for any of these movies we still love these still oh, like oh, these yeah. movies a lot and love these movies you know we just got to for the sake of a ranking we got to say the pros and we got to say the cons so now for attack of the clones i mean as much as you could say a lot of people say this is the worst star wars movie besides the last jedi but and i you know i may be more inclined to agree with them in a, in a greatest star wars movie ranking but in my fa- as you know as one of my favorites, I think it fits at episode eight because I am a prequel fan overall because I grew up, you know, in the prequel era when the prequel movies were coming out. And, you know, all the toys were prequel based, Anakin, Obi-Wan, everything. Yep. And Attack of the Clones, Anakin as a child was my favorite. Still, I mean, R2-D2 was always my favorite character, but then my favorite human character was Anakin. And before I really grew to love Luke a lot more. But Anakin was always my favorite um, character. And... I loved kind of the dynamic between him and Padme, even though the dialogue is bad and the, and it's kind of cheesy. But I mean, the evolution of their um, of their love for each other and their relationship, it's necessary to the plot, because when you look at it, George Lucas, when he made the prequels, had a plan as to he had, a, you know, he had a beginning, which is the Phantom Menace. They're going to find Anakin on Tatooine. And then the ending was Anakin's going to turn to Darth Vader because some we know somehow he has to have kids because. He, oh, you know, Luke and Leia. So we know, and then he says, "All right, there's going to have to be a girl that he's going to fall in love with and have kids with." But then somehow he's going to be separated from that girl, whether she lives off somewhere in the galaxy, and then we bring her back for his episode, his version of episode seven, eight, nine, or whether she dies. There, there's going to need to be some sort of romantic interest for Anakin. So he that and then he uses the idea of attachment is forbidden, which I compl- I love the fact that he did this to show how Anakin turned to the dark side because that was his greatest weakness was the love. And um, that's really the whole story of Anakin is that his greatest weakness is love. It's his greatest weakness on the on the light side because his love for Padme makes him turn to the dark side to try to save her. And then even when he's redeemed, it's love for his son that turns him back to the light yes. and makes him kill Palpatine. So this movie is the birth of the entire in my opinion it's the birth of one of the most important plot points in all of star wars and that's anakin's worst quality which in a way is his best quality as well of that being love because it turns him to the dark side and then it turns him back to the light so that to me is my favorite part about this movie is the whole dynamic with anakin and um padme and then of course i mean ewan mcgregor was good in the phantom menace but he didn't have that much of a spotlight i mean he just blows it out of the park in this movie i mean he's one of my favorite actors obviously we all love him as star wars and most specifically as prequel fans and that's why we are cannot wait to see the kenobi series um hopefully Definitely. sometime next year but I mean, you and McGregor just did amazing. I mean, I think the acting in this movie, minus the if you take if you look at the acting as a whole, and not so much the fact that George Lucas is not the greatest writer, because as much as I love him and he's one of the greatest, you know, film creators, one of the greatest visionary, creative minded people Hollywood has ever seen, he is in no way a good writer. And I think and he even admits that to himself. He despises writing. But the fact is that he couldn't get anybody else to direct or write the movie with him. So he um, his dialogue, I mean, you know, the the little intricate details, that stuff's not the greatest. The CGI is still a little outdated, except for the Geonosis scene at the end, not the Coliseum scene. The Geonosis Coliseum, that's outdated. But I mean, the Clone Wars, the the, clo- the start of the Clone Wars, that battle was amazing. I like the fight at the end, you know, Yoda flipping around like, <laughs> like you know, <laughs> yeah. wasn't really the best choice. You know, you kind of want to see him as always being like what he is um you know always like the wise jedi you know if we never would have saw him fighting i think everyone would have been fine it would have been fine with it we wouldn't have been saying oh we should have seen him fight in the prequels but whatever i mean dooku as a character was set up in this movie nicely you know they keep him alive and then you know we we see the death star the death stars and we see how the death star plans were were birthed between dooku and the people of the banking clan you know with all those weird talking aliens like the unga unga guy who like doesn't even say any words but he has the little voice thing um um, that guy, and then um, why can I? I always forget what's the name of the Geonosian leader. Oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, I can't remember his name either. 
it's it's a it's um oh pago the lesser and pago the lesser um sitting there and that you show that like you know he has the death star plans then he gives it to um to uh dooku and it also sets up for the clone wars tv show knowing that dooku knows about all of palpatine i mean palpatine was very open to dooku about everything he was going to do i mean dooku could have completely sabotaged palpatine by going back to the jedi and saying look you have the sith lord is in control of the senate which he did tell obi-wan but he didn't believe him and there's a plot to destroy the jedi but you know then palpatine just does palpatine and revenge of the sith and has anakin kill him because you know palpatine's the greatest mastermind in all of star wars but um, I would think this movie set up a lot of great things for Revenge of the Sith, which is a completely fantastic movie, both subjectively because of how much I love it and grew up with it, and also objectively for I think everyone believes that it's a good, if not great, movie. Um, and it sets up for that nicely. And like I said, it, it puts a lot of things into place that set up for the entire rest of the saga. And I think people overlook that. Um, very often. So, um, Captain, why don't you go into your number seven, which is the movie that I just discussed. discussed. So why don't yeah. you uh, talk about clones. it yourself? I love Attack of the Clones, but I have to admit there are some janky stuff in it. Um, now, I love it because I love Clone Boys. Clone Boys are, <laughs> are just absolutely beautiful. I love I love the look of Phase 2 armor, but I prefer... Uh, I, in fact, no, I prefer the look of Phase 2 to Phase oh, 1. I, phase one I like more. I like Phase 2 as well. Yeah, Phase 1's what they were in Attack of the Clones, but yeah. it was... It, right, the bad points were it of... Uh, it it kind of had the same problem as uh, Phantom Menace. It drones on. It does drone on a little bit. Uh, not as much as Phantom Menace, which I, yeah. I'm perfectly fine with, but, you know, there's just stupid decisions in it, like making Jar Jar a guy of political power. I'm like, yeah. Oh. He was, he, he, some, he was somehow given the rank of general in the yeah. first movie. Why is he now put in charge of basically the entire setting, universe? Yeah, setting up for the, the fall. But I do like the fact that what we, what, you, what they never tell you, unless you extend the universe, is Jar Jar realizes what he's done, goes yeah. home and kills himself through depression. And I'm like, Ugh. That's that's a good ending to Jar Jar. That is, that, I mean, it's it's a character arc. As sad as it is, it's a character arc. He should be dead, sir. So yeah, <laughs> so he, he's he's gone. Um, but yeah, no, it was just the, my only my only problem with Attack of the Clones is the fact that it so it 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 suffers from its predecessor of it drones on. Like you could you could get into it straight away. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, like by straight away, you could spend forty minutes minimum. No, forty minutes maximum, like setting up for the giant Geonosis battle, and then have that as as like towards the end. Because I can't remember the runtime uh, for Attack of the Clones. It was like an I hour. I believe it was. I believe it was like two and a half. I was. It was the longest before the Last Jedi. I think. Really, I think it the was Rise like... of Skywalker was longer than it. Yeah. Oh god. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense then uh, of, of why I, I I put it here and it drones on. But you you had so bad that you could just you could have literally just ended it with giant space battle. And but no, it's yeah, it's two hours and twenty two minutes. It it could have just done so much better. But it drones on for too long. That's my only problem with it. All right. So um yeah. So now I'm gonna get into my uh seven. Which is um, the Phantom Menace. I I love the Phantom Menace. I like how you know the idea of finding Anakin on Tatooine. You know, Metaclorians a little shaky, but I like the whole Tatooine arc. Um, I think it's set up for the prequel trilogy nicely. I didn't like the whole all, really any of the Gungan stuff. I love the dynamic between Obi Wan and Qui Gon, which I think is one of the, probably the most underrated relationships in all of Star Wars. I mean, the dynamic between them. I mean, Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor, two fantastic actors, one of the greatest, two of the greatest actors in all of Hollywood. Um, they both, I mean, the dynamic and chemistry between them was just absolutely incredible, and. Um, and then you see the development of Obi-Wan from, you know, a Padawan in the beginning of the movie to a Jedi Knight at the end, getting knighted by Yoda, and then taking on Anakin as his apprentice. And it, and it sets it up nicely um, to where, I mean, Qui-Gon kind of did need to die because obviously we know that Obi-Wan um, Obi trains Anakin. And then once Qui-Gon finds Anakin, we know like, okay, yeah, somehow Qui-Gon's going to have to die. 
And I mean, I mean, I'm just going to quick, I, I agree with the, some of the criticisms and the praises that you, that you said, so I'm not going to go on too long, but the greatest, I mean, just greatest lightsaber battle, in my opinion, besides like episodes five and six, I mean, those are just like, that's because of the more of the meaning behind those lightsaber battles, like the um, return of the Jedi lightsaber battle with um, Luke and Vader is my personal favorite. And then um, Luke and Vader in episode five is right after that. And those two are the best. I think we can say those two are the best because of the meaning behind it and the importance. But I mean, in choreo from a choreography standpoint, I think episodes two and episode, and even the, um, even Obi-Wan and Anakin at the end of episode three, which is still a ma an amazing fight. I think that was a little too over choreographed, I think. And then in the original trilogy, it was under choreographed because they just didn't have this right technology. I think Phantom Menace is the happy medium in between that is just absolutely breathtaking and beautiful. It looks incredibly realistic, that whole fight scene. And then, you know, when Darth Maul kills Qui-Gon and there's the emotion in Obi-Wan and, you know, almost really like his anger taking over for him. And then he, him killing Darth Maul. Well, not really killing him, but slicing him in half. And somehow he miraculously survives after falling down probably like a thousand feet worth of a nuclear reactor. Yes. But um, yeah. And just like you were saying before, Captain, it's, it's a very good movie. I love the movie. Um, it sets up nicely for um, the prequel, the whole prequel trilogy as a whole. Um, I, I like how they did the politics in this movie. I like the whole introduction of Palpatine and how he kind of rose to power. I think it was a little convenient that it was just like, oh, a vote of no uh, no vote of no confidence for this chancellor, Chancellor Valorum. And then like instantly Palpatine, you know, has all the power in the world. I think it was a little convenient, but hey, Star Wars is full of plot conveniences, as we know. And so we can't really criticize all those plot conveniences because if it wasn't for plot conveniences, Star Wars would definitely not be as popular as it is today. But um, yeah, so the movie, I love the movie. I think it's a very good movie overall. I think it gets a bad rap because a lot of people say, oh, it's one of the, you know, it's probably like the bottom three Star Wars movies. I, I just completely disagree with that. I think people have to people have to watch it with an open mind and realize that it's really not as bad of a movie as everyone thinks it is. Um, and so, yeah, I have it as my uh, number seven. And um, now captain, you're going to get into your number six, which was my number 10. And then my number six was your number 10. So now you'll be, you guys will be hearing opposite viewpoints on two separate movies. So captain, why don't you go ahead? Well, my number six is rogue one. And the only thing I have to say, uh, literally, I love this movie, right? But I don't like the fact that everybody dies. That's the only reason. Uh, like, admittedly, mm -hmm. it is the most Star Wars of Star Wars because it's literally, you know, people fighting. A, a, it's, it's like, what, 20 odd people fighting yeah. an entire base. <laughs> and, I'm like, and they yeah, almost that, that's win. exactly what Star Wars is. Yeah, and they almost win, which is the impressive thing. They're just like kicking so much ass. And I'm like, yeah, go on, do it. And then, you know, the, the greatest backhand in existence where. Um, Director Krennic looks up and then is immediately vaporized by his own creation. Every time that happens, me and my friends burst out laughing because it is the biggest backhand in existence. I don't care what anybody says about CGI Grand Moff Tarkin. That's a abs that's a, an amazing feat of technology for the fact that they had to they didn't do what they do now, where they 3D scan your face in just in case. They had to go back and reconstruct his face from old movies, right? So I'm I'm perfectly fine with what they did. I liked it. They could have played it off where you only see him in a reflection. That would have made him a little bit more sinister if he never faced camera. But apart from that, my only criticism is everybody dies. And there are so many spots within the final part of the movie where everybody could... Well, not everybody, because obviously, you know, shot. But the main cast, there are plenty of spots in the ending of the movie to the point where they could have escaped and then yeah. obviously oh we can't have them in yeah, the... you, could, you, you could have said that they all live through every single part of it and then you could have had them in you know episode uh, 8 or 9 it would have been pretty interesting to kill them yeah. off then when they're old yeah. And, yeah. But or, that, that's or you could do what they did with, or you could do what they did with Captain Rex and they could just point out some random fighter on Endor and say, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's Rex. Which, yeah, if it looks like him. Funnily enough, before I knew Rex existed, I, I, that was my favorite guy. Because <laughs> just an old bloke. Yeah. Who, it's just, You're oh, still we're, fighting. we're going into this forest planet. Old bloke. Oh, Rogue. And, <laughs> but yeah, my, my only problem with Rogue One is everybody dies when really the only people that needed to die was that rapper guy who somehow, I can't remember his name, but he's the he's the guy who talks to Bode in the ship, the or the other black guy. 
He's a Forrest rapper. Whitaker? The guy that Forrest Whitaker plays? No, the soldier guy. Uh, when they're on the when they're on Scarif, and he's like, I've got a board. He's like, I've got to plug into the thing over there, and he's like, Right, okay. And that all oh, these lines. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Not the um. I think he's like the the. I think he's Hawaiian or something, right? He yeah, has like I that so, Hawaiian. He's, he's, it's he's not um. Rapper. It's not. It's the guy who goes out. Yeah, it's the guy who goes out with like the like the machine gun type thing after um the uh, oh I can't remember his name either. The um a moment the force the forces with me. The guy who like after that guy dies he goes out. I, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm talking. I'm talking about. He's not one of the main cast. One of the side cast just has like a little bit of dialogue. But oh the only reason- wait. Okay, I think I do know what you're yeah, talking. Yeah, oh, now I know what you're talking he's about. One of, he's one of the soldiers that yeah, just yeah, out there. They, yeah. He's like a teenager. He looks yes, like a teenager. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I he's just in that, and uh, he was in it because he's a rapper, I think, and he's yeah. English. And I was like, right, okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna cast, and this is what they should have done, if they, if you're gonna attempt to do a um, Saving Private Ryan, almost, why not just have Tom Hanks as one of the soldiers? That would have been <laughs> funny as hell. <laughs> just Tom Hanks running across a beach, gets blown up by you know an AT or whatever they're called that would have been funny but yeah, yeah only problem with rogue one is that too many people die when there are too many plot hole convenience points where they could have jumped out of death and lived to be in pre uh other movies yeah. all right so now i'm going to get into my number six which i'm sure you're not going to be too happy with mm-hmm. the rise of skywalker which i have to admit i absolutely love as somebody who's not a, as somebody who's not a sequel fan whatsoever <laughs> I really like what they did with this movie. I, I completely understand every single criticism that I've heard about this movie. Everything that you said, I completely understand that. But to me, it's just Star Wars. It's just wrapping up the saga that has become that you know that I love so much. That's been such a big part of my life, and I just absolutely love it for that. I think um, I like. I, I do agree that the like basically the first hour, that whole stuff on um, Pisana, that could have been in the opening crawl, and the whole movie could have just been Kylo Ray. And um, and uh, could have just been Kylo Ren and Palpatine. Now, I love the fact that they brought Palpatine back. I do believe it retcons a little bit Anakin's story, but I I just kind of like the fact of him being the big bad villain again. Um, I did not like the mechanical arm thing whatsoever. I wish like if it would have just been regular Palpatine, a lot of people would have complained and said, how is that possible? I would have rather had that than the mechanical thing that he was in. But then, of course, at the end, and when he drains the life out of Kylo and Rey, you know, that was real Palpatine. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, the, the whole first half of the movie is mainly just like plot development stuff. So I'm mainly going to be talking about more the end of the movie because that's the stuff that I like. Um, the whole dynamic with Rey and Kylo, I absolutely love. I like the fact that they made her a Palpatine, which really like kills me that at the end she says Rey Skywalker because I wish she would have just said Rey. Ray Palpatine, and that would have been her version of just completely transforming that name and taking something bad into something good. And mm-hmm. that's that's the arc of Star Wars. That's the story of Star Wars, not to just conform to someone else's family name just because you see Luke and Leia in the distance, which to me just doesn't make any sense. But um, I, I love the whole um, Ray and Kylo thing. I completely, before the movie, I was like, they're going to redeem Kylo. I really don't want to. I hope like kill him somehow like because i mean as bad as vader was like this is a guy who just we have never really seen any i mean we have seen some good in him but i mean even it just the way it starts in the movie on like on mustafar when he's just killing all those people and he cuts off the head of the of the um of the bulio the spy and he puts it on the table i mean that is just like that's like all right yeah when that happened in the movie i was like all right they're definitely not redeeming him and i never wanted them to redeem him but how they did it I just absolutely fell in love with, and I then I really, really liked the idea after I saw it on screen. Um, the the Han memory, I mean, I completely believe that it was, I, I absolutely, like, I freaked out when I saw that on screen. I love that they got Harrison Ford. Obviously, they had to get him or else they wouldn't have done it, but I love the fact that they had Harrison Ford there. I love that he, Han was the one to redeem his son. What I do think was, in a way, a little bit of a missed opportunity, even though he never met Anakin. 
I would have loved if that was if that was Hayden Christensen as Anakin, kind of telling him like, listen, I did the same thing you did. Don't fall down the same path. They're still good in you. You can save the ones you love. Everything, you know, everything that Anakin, that you know, the original, the arc of Anakin always preached. I think that would have been good. Also, you know, Luke says at the end of Last Jedi, um, "See you around, kid." If it was Luke, it would have worked. And if it was Leia, it would have worked. So, in my opinion, there's four characters that would have worked there. And out of all four of them, I think the one that I probably least wanted to see ended up being in the movie, but I still absolutely absolutely loved it because of how much yep. I love Han Solo. But um, then uh, I, 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 one, I mean, this is a little biased because R2 is my favorite character. I didn't really like the fact that R2, again, just like for the whole sequel trilogy, is kind of just sitting at the base. He's in like two scenes. Like he's there when Leia <laughs> okay. dies. But the fact that you have BB-8 out there and 3PO, why not have R2 out there? He's just as important as any of them. He's the reason why the whole, well, you know, why Luke found them all. Um. So, you know, carrying the message from Leia. But, you know, that's just a little biased discrepancy. But, um, yeah, I like the movie as a whole. And then I think I think the whole um, – all the stuff at the end with Exegol and then Kylo coming back and with being redeemed and fighting alongside Rey, I absolutely love that. Really, I mean this is probably an unpopular opinion. Now I, my, my opinion's completely changed. But going into this movie, I didn't really like Kylo as a character. It has nothing to do with Adam Driver's acting. But I just think I just didn't like like him as a character at all. This movie made me absolutely love him. And really showed how good of an actor Adam Driver is, and how he almost carried this tr- trilogy just like yeah. Ewan McGregor did in the prequels. Um, but I-, I loved when they redeemed him, and I loved when he came back to Exegol. And then I-, I didn't really like the you know the Force Amazon Prime where you know Ray put the lightsaber behind his back and then it was there. I did love the shrug because it's exactly what Han did. I compl- I absolutely love that shrug. And then and then he you know he kills all the Knights of Ren. And then when he goes into fight side by side with Ray, I wish it would have just been them like duel. If it would have been them dueling Palpatine, even like with a lightsaber, even though the original Palpatine that we saw didn't have a lightsaber, but something other than just him shooting lightning at Ray and then it blowing back at his face. But um, you know when he drains the life out of them, I thought that was really cool. And I like that Ben is the first one to rise because a lot of people are saying, "Oh, Ray's so powerful. She's Mary Sue. You know, she's not a Skywalker ever." But then. Ben being the first one to rise shows that Ben really is more powerful and that the light side, a Skywalker, is more powerful than the dark side, a Palpatine like Rey. So yep. he rises first, which a lot of people look past. He rises first, then Palpatine says, and gone is the last Skywalker, and he chucks him off the thing, and somehow he survives. And then, you know, I love the fact that Rey, um, you know, like, gets up to, like, confront him. But then I really don't like how he just completely died so just yeah, having lightning shot down and back into his face that just completely I, I that didn't that didn't go over well with me but besides from those criticisms i really liked the movie as a whole my favorite part was definitely the stuff on octo when um when she went back to octo octo and uh luke grabs the lightsaber and says this is not how you you know a jedi's mm. weapon deserves more respect i mean that was pure mark hamill the rise of the the last jedi mark hamill was not that wasn't Luke Skywalker. No, that wasn't. Rise of Skywalker, Mark Hamill. That is yep. Luke Skywalker. This is exactly what I always wanted to see Luke Skywalker. He's the wise. Now he's like he's the Obi Wan of this of this movies, which is exactly what George Lucas wanted him to be in his version of Episode Seven, Eight, and Nine, which Disney scrapped. But this is the Luke that I always wanted to see—the old wise Jedi who learned from everything in the past and learned from everything that happened to him. Not you know the uh, you know I'm forgetting about everything, just like we saw in. The Last Jedi, but yeah, so I I love the movie a lot. I was I would had really high expectations going into it, and I also had really high expectations going into The Last Jedi, and that was the complete disastrous disappointment for me when I walked out of the movie. Um, a lot of people who didn't like The Last Jedi said, "Oh, I don't really care about the Rise of Skywalker; it's going to be bad anyway." I walked in incredibly optimistically, saying, "Oh, I really hope this is amazing." I loved all the trailers, um, and yeah, so. And I like I like how they brought Lando back. I wish he would have had a little bit more of a significance, but I like him fil- um, piloting the Falcon with Chewie again. But um, yeah, and I so I like the movie overall, and uh, it finds itself at the number six spot for me. All right, so now we're gonna get into um, Captain's number five choice, which is the same as my number five choice. So I guess if we we can kind of just do this together, I, I think the I think same anyway. So you can just the next can two talk because and the next then... two are the same. Yeah. So. so Episode five, yeah, uh, sorry, number five for both of us is Ranger of the Sith. Yes. Uh, good points. It is literally the Clone Wars. That's the yeah. only reason I like it. It sets up Darth Vader kind of a little bit cheesily, but it still sets up Darth Vader. 
Um, the ships in it, the fact that the, we now see the Venator class Star Destroyer, I'm like, oh, I fell in love. <laughs> and it was very nice to see some of the different um, clone companies. We get to see the 500. Uh, we get uh, we get to see the 500 first a little bit in the most badass scene ever, where they just yeah. massacre everyone in the Jedi Temple. And we get to see uh, the uh, 212 Star Corps, which is Commander Cody's um, group in the Utapau Orange. Uh, we get to see them as well, and it's very nice. And uh, we f- we finally get to see just how everything uh, went down, and it was it was absolutely beautiful to just see this thing. The only bad thing I'd say about it is the fact that Darth Vader right at the end screams out no because yeah, he because he I didn't know agree. that he killed his wife. But if he yeah. was if he was that madly in love with his wife, he would have known. And it, yeah, yeah, he get he, he's in episode two. It was kind of Interesting seeing how he went from weird, creepy, rapey teenage guy to yeah. now dating this extremely beautiful woman. Um, and then he just kind of goes insane. And I was kind of like, oh, it's not, I understand why he goes insane, but that's not, it, it should have been, it should have been done better. Uh, yeah. And obviously, we do get, I think, one of my favorite lines in Star Wars, which is, So this is how Liberty dies with thunderous <laughs> applause, which I've used so many times when looking at real world political situations. Yeah, that is true. Uh, but bad points. I, I'm just... going to be completely honest. I, I'm not going to say there's no negatives. No, about... but there's not a lot, is but, there? Yeah, there really isn't a lot. I mean, like, before, before we get into the negatives, I just want to reiterate some of the stuff that you said, some of my favorite stuff about the movie. I absolutely loved how they closed off the prequel trilogy with, yep. you know, the journey of Anakin completely to the dark side, completely setting up everything we saw of Darth Vader. I think maybe if we would have got a little bit more of him as Darth Vader in the end, maybe if like the last hour was when he was Darth Vader, instead of all that setup that we got in the beginning. But I, I love the whole opening sequence that Coruscant, the Battle of Coruscant, is, it's beautifully shot. The music One of the is best, beautiful. Yeah, music of, yeah, of course, John Williams is just incredible. I mean, that's a given for every single one of these movies. Even The oh, Last yeah, Jedi, which I hate. Even The Last Jedi, which I hate, is probably one, like my maybe in like my top three scores of all Star Wars, that score is incredible. But, but it pairs beautifully with the yeah. action that's going on. Oh, yeah, definitely. And um, the Revenge of the Sith, the opening scene was amazing with Grievous. You know, I mean, of course, all the memes in this movie. That's, oh, that's yeah. that, that may be one of the best parts. Um, the The whole opening sequence, basically, I mean, just everything in this entire movie i absolutely love and like i really can't find that much negative nope. i just love every minute of this movie from the battle on coruscant to obi-wan handing luke off and, and there's another thing i mean at the end the fact how they wrap this up it was very nice the wrong not blown up yet and then like the ending with you know ewan mcgregor as obi-wan holding Luke and giving him to to Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru, and then looking off into the sunset at the Twin Suns. I mean, it's just like, it's just an incredible, it's a, you know, it's a moment that gives you chills. It just sets up everything that we get in the original trilogy. And it's, it's everything that a Star Wars fan could have wanted. You know, an original trilogy Star Wars fan watching Revenge of the Sith should absolutely love every moment of it because it sets up everything that they love from that original movie. I mean, every there, there's not that many plot holes at the end of this movie mm-hmm. most everything's set up i mean yeah it's stupid that how padme dies you know she dies of you know a broken heart which i do think is another thing that's really really um weird and ironic and you know i mean this is a little controversial to say but in my opinion proves that there is a god by how this thing that about how this thing in star wars worked the fact that leia's mother in star wars Padme dies of a broken heart. And in real life, Carrie Fisher, who obviously plays Leia, after she died, her mother, Debbie Reynolds, essentially died of the, the doctor said yeah. of a broken heart. She had a heart attack because it just died because like she was so broken over the death of her daughter, which I think is is um is incredibly ironic, just you know, as Palpatine says. I mean, the you know, the whole the whole Palpatine Anakin dynamic, and then you know, when Anakin um realizes that Palpatine is Darth Sidious when all the Jedi realize that Palpatine's Darth Sidious and they go to confront him and kill him. And then when Anakin, one of the most beautiful scenes in all of Star Wars, which is also completely underrated and overlooked, is when Anakin is sitting on the couch and then Pat at the Jedi, or is sitting on the chair at the Jedi Temple, and then Padme is sitting on her on the couch at their home. And they're both just looking out across Coruscant. And that eerie, um, you know, like not blaringly loud, low-playing 
John Williams. Um, it's like some sort of chant. Just, yeah, just plays under them staring across. And the, and the thing like, is, they're not the they're not just they're not just staring in a general direction of each yeah, other. They're staring they're literally right at each other. eye to eye. And it's, it's just, just it's, very it's nice. amazing. And yeah, so you know, like I said, you know, I mean, I really can't find that many negatives. Nope. I really just love everything about this movie. It sets up the original trilogy, wraps up the prequel trilogy, gives us a whole bunch of new memes, and gives us the Anakin Skywalker that we always wanted to see. That the turn to the dark side, more incredible acting by Ewan McGregor. Yeah. Um, and Gre- I think- Grievous is still a nice character. He's kind of overlooked in this movie. I think he's a lot more appreciated because of in the Clone Wars. And um, I mean, I just like the whole movie is just the evolution of Anakin. Everything he does is. is more and more to the dark side. And it just shows how George Lucas says that the whole first six movies, it's the story of Anakin Skywalker. It's not the story of Luke. I mean, George Lucas says it himself. Anakin's still the chosen one. Anakin was always the chosen one. And Luke was just a catalyst to to get Anakin to bring balance to the force. So, I mean, I, I don't know. Are there any specific negatives you want to go into before we move on or no? I think the only negative I can think of is its heavy use of uh, CGI and Jango Fett's head onto all the clone bodies. Yeah. Where, like, when, when they take the... It, they should have just had a real... Better. They should have just had the real yeah. actor. The it, CGI it, was a little overdone. Well, Although no, it looks no, a lot better sh- in this movie than the other two. They shouldn't have... I, what I mean is they shouldn't have CGI'd his... Uh, his armor, his, like, when Cordy takes off his yeah, armor, yeah, it, it shouldn't have been CGI it armor. It should have been a real, been, real uh, actor. Because then it would have... Yeah, you could have... You, yeah. you would have been able to get better lighting on it. But I think... The excessive use of CGI in some areas is the only problem I can find with it. Yeah, and the, the extremely obviously choreographed fight scene at the end. Yeah. Though though epic it is. Yes. Some of the moves that they do make no sense. That's yeah. the, those are like the only like bad the points. Spinning like around think. lightsaber for like ten ten seconds and then like yeah. Flash. And and the only reason it's at five is because the ones before like four, three, two, and one are just not that much better. But to, to like to me, and we're all, we are almost identical in the way we've done this. Um, yes, just, I do completely agree. As they're, they're just, just like great said, movies. Yeah, and we'll move on to number four, which is identical again. I think it's you know it's another spot yeah, that we have the same. Um, we both have Solo, a Star Wars story, so we'll kind of do what we did with Revenge of the Sith. You'll talk about what you liked. I'll talk about um, what I liked, and then I mean I, I don't know about you, but again, I don't really find too many flaws in this movie. There's flaws where there's criticism that a lot of people have where I can understand, but in my opinion, yeah. I don't view them as necessarily flaws. So why don't you start with some of the positives from this movie? Well, the the major positives are probably for me um, the setup of Han Solo himself. I don't. I don't care the fact that you know he walks to that he walks up to the Imperial guy and he's like I'm going to be a pilot one day. Like, yeah, yeah let's make you a pilot mate what's your clan name and he's like I don't have one and he's like mm, solo so, I, I've got no problem with that because on Corellia people have family names if you don't got a family name they, well you, you you've got to come up with something so the guy yeah. was just like man you're alone I'm not going to call you Han alone that makes no sense yeah. uh, solo yeah. yeah, yeah. Han all by himself. No, that one doesn't work. <laughs> but yeah, I had no problem with how he got his last name. I do like the fact that he's, even though he never uses it in future movies, yeah, his blaster is um, multi-adaptable to the point where it's like a sniper rifle at one point yeah. and it's like a mini rifle at another point. I like that. I love um, the entire crew, even though a lot of them die quite quickly early on in the in the movie. Uh, even one, I'd like to point out, one of them dies in a deleted scene, which is pretty funny. One of um, Beckett's crew dies in a deleted scene, which was kind of, uh, oh, but he went out oh, pretty cool. Yeah, no, uh, on the mud planet, uh, he just gets blown up. Uh, that's mm-hmm. about it. Um, but yeah, I, I liked I liked Beckett as a character. I even liked what's his face as um, Crimson Dawn, as the the leader of the Crimson Dawn, not Darth Maul, but. I can't remember the actor's name. He plays Vision. Uh, I can't remember his name, but I, I liked him as as the character he played. Overall, the only problem I have with it, apart from the weird politically woke droid that doesn't need to be in yeah, the movie, yeah, completely pointless. I, I did, yeah. Um, the only problem I had was Donald Glover. Not yeah. playing Lando, but doing a Billy D impersonation. That's the only yes. problem I've got with this movie. I is... I completely agree. I real I think Alden Ehrenreich did an incredible job as 
Ford or something. Like a lot of people didn't want to go see this movie because they were like, oh, I don't I don't want to see anybody else but Harrison Ford by Han Solo. I think Alden Ehrenreich did an absolutely incredible job and does not get enough credit for it. I will say I like Donald Glover. I mean, I loved him on Community and I think he's a decent oh, you know, I like musician too. And he, but I really did not like how he played Lando at all. I just don't think he captured it anything no, that I, Billy like, D. Williams did. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that that really is my main and only criticism of this movie is Donald Glover as Lando, just like you said. But um, some of the positives that I have, I mean, the, the whole movie, uh, people can say it's useless and doesn't need to be here. But I mean, I love the whole dynamic with, with Han and, and Kira. And I think, I think this is the definition of a Star Wars story, something that we don't need, but something that's so far from everything else that it's its its own thing. And it's basically, it's like its own movie. Like I could sit and watch Solo and not have to watch all the other Star Wars movies. Like if I sit exactly. down and watch Attack of the Clones, I'm like, oh, I can't just watch Attack of the Clones. I have to watch The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and then I have to watch Revenge of the Sith afterwards. I can just sit down right now on my couch and watch Solo and enjoy it for the movie that it is because it's just an action-packed – I mean a lot of people say – the Mandalorian and Rogue One is the most Star Warsy stuff we've gotten from Disney. I mean, I think The Mandalorian is the most or the most um original trilogy like Star Wars stuff. I yeah. think this I think this besides The Mandalorian is is pretty original trilogy Star oh, Wars. Yeah. I mean, it's just insane action scenes. I also still think this is the best looking Star Wars movie probably because of how much money they invested into this thing. I mean, the whole Kessel Run stuff, I mean, that just looked absolutely beautiful. I, and um, I would like to point out I do, even though everybody's like a parsec is not, you know, a unit of yeah. distance. I like the fact that at the end of it he's still yeah. like just did it in 12 parsecs. Yeah, 12 parsecs. <laughs> and then um yeah, and I love I love the whole like they say that like um John Favreau said the Mandalorian was supposed to be like a, like a Wild West type Star Wars movie. Yeah, it's I like a space Western. Start, yeah, TV show. I think this is like a space Western, exactly, just like the Mandalorian. I mean, Han is just he's a, they're all complete gun, they're all complete guns, um, gunslinger smugglers. And then, I mean, the fact like at the end where they just go back and forth, like where Han, you know, where, where Han says I was listening the whole time, and you told yeah, like, me uh, mm-hmm. I forgot the exact line he said, yeah. but um, and then he turns it right back onto um. Beckett. I mean, the whole dynamic between them, it's almost like a father and son type dynamic thing. And then they just kind of keep getting back at each other. And then, of course, at the end with the Darth Maul cameo, cameo, I thought that was pretty cool. And then Kira going away. And I think it perfectly set it up for a sequel, which sadly I don't think we'll get unless it's the form of a TV show on Disney Plus. Because since I think they thought the reception to this movie would be a lot better because they didn't know how bad or how bad people would view The Last Jedi. Um, so they set it up for a sequel, not knowing that there's probably no room in their budget to make a sequel for it as much as I would want it. And someone like you would want it. And I, hey, I'd this, watch it as a TV yeah, show. There's millions of other, yeah, I'd watch it as a TV show too. I think it would work better as a movie, but I just don't see them doing that. I think maybe as a, you know, a TV show and, you know, I mean, yeah, like uh, Alden Ehrenreich did a great job. Um, Amelia Clark did a great job as, as a uh, Cura. Um, I mean, the Darth Maul, Maul cameo was really cool. Chewie, obviously, you know, I, the origin story with Chewie, I thought was pretty cool. Um, it's a little different from, I mean, he was still in slavery, but it was a little different from him. You know, they say that Han went to, Han had to end up freeing like a bunch of Wookiees for, um, and then go to Kashyyyk with Chewie. And then Chewie like said like, oh, I'll come with you. That was in Legends. So this movie kind of like made it a little bit different, but still the same gist. I mean, he saved um, yeah. Chewie and then Chewie went back to save everyone else. Um. Yeah, I just think it's very Star Warsy. I, I loved Han. I loved, um, you know, how he's also motivated by. We always see him as, the, you know, the charming Han Solo. He's motivated by love in this movie, just as he was in the original trilogy. You know, his love for Leia and his as Luke and for Luke as a friend, and obviously, you know, for the Millennium Falcon. I like how it ends with, you know, him winning the Falcon, and um, you know, I thought Infus Nest was pretty cool. I didn't yeah, really like them at the beginning, but then towards the end, they become pretty badass. The whole ch- oh, also, I, I I can't I can't talk about this movie without mentioning, um, oh, I can't remember his name. Who's the Who's the guy with the four um with like the four arms? Uh, the guy uh, yeah, pilots. the little guy. Yeah, I can't oh, remember. He is he is amazing. I absolutely favorite characters. I I wish he wouldn't have died so soon. But and that whole sequence on the train. The, the whole train sequence that that heist that that, was just that reminded me of Firefly. Yeah, that was just that was just amazing. So yeah, so um, I don't know if you have anything else to touch on, or if we should go into. No, our, I think we've I think we've covered it. All right. So now our top three are all um original trilogy movies, but our orders are different 
for every single one. So, Captain, why don't you start off with your number three? Uh, funnily enough, it's Return of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. And the only reason it's here is pretty much because of where it appeared in in the trilogy. It was a very good ending movie. A lot of people don't like Return of the Jedi, which is kind of weird. But it was yeah, I very, don't understand that either. It was a very good end to a trilogy that they'd set up because it wrapped pretty much, uh, not everything, but it pretty much wrapped everything up. It gave us one of the best memes in existence with It's a Trap. <laughs> uh, which was f- funny as hell. It, o- it also gave us, and I can't believe that they took this out, but the Nyub Nyub song that the uh, Ewoks do right at the I, end, uh, dance around. I like to touch on that. It would be very controversial. <laughs> um, the, it has probably the best space battle I've seen in any movie, yeah, uh, or TV show, uh, including things like Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I do like the fact that it's ju- it is it is a perfect end. There is. Sure, there's probably like one or two little things that you could probably say, uh, this didn't really need to happen. Like the fact that the Emperor knows that they're coming because they gave yeah. out the, that was kind of they're like that, that felt shoehorned in there a little bit, yeah. Uh, but no, it's it's literally here at three because it is the perfect end to a good series of movies that were uh, maybe not the best thought out as we see with the fact that at one point, Luke and Leia are going to get busy, and then they realize, oh, we're brother and sister. That w- that was obviously never planned out. Um, so, you know, obviously the movies weren't planned out that well. But for where it comes in as a movie, uh, in, in the story, it fits It fits in like a perfect jigsaw piece out of these three. It's it's yeah. absolutely beautiful. Um, So before I go on to my number three, I just... Yep, no. I love the Yub Nub song. I, this is this is incredible. I can't believe I'm going to say this because I know I'm going to the comments for this. I like the song that they put in in the special editions more oh. only because I think it just goes better with the scene. I absolutely it's probably my favorite track in all of Star Wars is the is the one that they have in now. Um, and I just think you know it, it fits more for when Luke looks out and sees Obi Wan and Anakin and Yoda. I think that the, the new theme kind of fits more than just you know the playful childish yub nub. And I know I'm going to get a lot of crap from the comments for that, but I just wanted to express my uh, my own personal opinion on that before I get into my number three. Yeah. And, uh, but when you say when you say Anakin, do you mean the original Anakin? I mean the Hayden Christensen Anakin. Oh, I think, listen, get listen, out. listen, listen. listen. I'm, the original Anakin, we have no to. We never saw, we never saw Sebastian Stan play Anakin Skywalker. We just saw his head. We just saw his face when his head came. I think it doesn't really make sense after they make the prequels. I think to put Hayden Christensen in there it made sense. Oh, so right. There's other there's other special edition changes which I don't agree with. Like there wasn't. I mean, yeah, it makes sense to change Boba Fett's voice. They could have just left the original voice actor in, but you know they do stuff to make it fit more with the prequels i mean i don't agree with everything lucas did but he had reason to do some of it but um all right so let's get into my number three which is star wars a new hope um i absolutely love 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 this movie um i just have it as number three because i think that the beginning is a little slow um other than that i really don't have any questions for this movie just like i don't with any of these top five movies that we've seen i really don't have any major criticisms in this movie i just don't necessarily like it as much as i do um five and six which will be in the spots before this or the spots after this um but i I, the movie i mean it's just it's the most influential movie in the history of of cinema i think that's a fair statement because without this i mean they say that the thing the thing that separates George Lucas from Disney is that every time George Lucas made a Star Wars trilogy, right, with the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy, and I'm sure he would have done something with the sequel trilogy, there was something that he did that wasn't from a writing standpoint, wasn't from a character development standpoint, wasn't from a plot standpoint. It was from an editing, special effects, direction standpoint that he completely revolutionized all of cinema within one movie with a new hope 
the special effects in a new hope i mean if that was just completely groundbreaking and it set up for everything i mean it completely changed movie history forever and completely changed how movies were made because of the the incredible special effects that george lucas pulled off in the original star wars movie a new hope i mean that's something that every single human being on the planet even if they don't like star wars never seen it or is a diehard star wars fan they have to give this movie credit for for being one of if not like in my opinion it is the most influential movies in all of cinema history and now um and then you look even in the prequel trilogy which i forgot to mention this earlier so i'll just quickly say it now i mean then in the prequel trilogy with the phantom menace as much as it looks outdated now when he put all those cgi in back then that was a revelation i mean that was that had a, just as big of an impact on the movie and the on the on hollywood as the special effects back in a new hope did and it's george lucas just doing groundbreaking things that changed not only the movie that he was making, not only the trilogy that he was making, not only the, the Star Wars saga as a whole and as an entity, but all of Hollywood and every movie that would come after that. I mean, you look, you know, like Jar Jar Binks was the first ever all CGI character. As much as people don't like Jar Jar Binks for how he talks, the dialogue that Lucas gave him, and people just think he's a stupid, unimportant character, which in a way he is, he's completely groundbreaking for the fact that he's all CGI and nobody's yep. ever seen that before. And now you look at movies and 99% of the characters are CGI in every single movie because of Jar Jar. And so that's something that, uh, you know, it started with the special effects in A New Hope and everything he did. I mean, introducing us to to the greatest story of all time, you know, a little farm boy who, you know, ha has a destiny to save the galaxy, but he just doesn't know it. And then an old hermit, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I mean, now you see what we got of him. And, you know, everyone loves you, McGregor, and wants to see Obi-Wan in action. I mean, back in 1977, he was just a little old hermit guy that nobody even knew who he was, who just comes out, you know, who comes out and yells, uh, you know, now the special effects, they have that crazy loud sound effect whatever the heck he yells the crate dragon call to scare away the jawas and um or the the tuscan raiders and it, you have all these characters who people would look at and say like oh that you know they mean nothing but george lucas takes them and they all have meaning and purpose you have a smuggler and his little little furry sidekick who end up being two of the best pilots in the galaxy and help two missions to destroy two Death Stars and take down the Empire. And then you have a little farm boy whose destiny is to, you know, bring balance to the force and, you know, eradicate and destroy the Sith and bring peace to the galaxy. And then you have a princess who, you know, obviously is the one who already started in royalty. You know, she could have a destiny. She already has a destiny completed from the beginning. But then she has a purpose to lead this rebellion and, and you know, take down the Empire, her, you know, along with Luke and Han. And so it just sets up all these incredible characters and just an incredible story. And I mean, I mean, this movie, I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, it's not I don't like it more than I like The Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi. But I just absolutely love, love, love this movie. And it gave us Star Wars. I mean, there's really nothing else you can say but the fact that it gave us Star Wars. And that's why I just absolutely love it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I really don't think. I mean, people can say there's as many people can say there's flaws as much as they want. In my opinion, I don't see flaws in, this, in any of these original trilogy movies. I mean, they're just complete and utter masterpieces in mm -hmm. their craft. And yeah, so um, now you want to get into your number two? See, I would, but you've basically just covered everything. <laughs> the only thing I would say uh, is like you touched on how. Uh, like George Lucas and um, making these movies helped push like special effect boundaries. Mm -hmm. People need to go and watch, and I can't remember if it was Adam Savage on Tested on YouTube or someone else, but they need to go and see how they managed to get um, the spaceships to actually appear on black backgrounds because it was broken. Right? If if we were to do if we were to do that now. Nobody would make a movie, okay? Yeah. Thanks to thanks to CGI and all this kind of stuff, we can just be like, oh yeah, no, we three D model it. Boom, there we go, flash through space. Back then, there are three different layers on top of each other every time a spaceship appears in space, right? And they were all they all had to be hand cut. They couldn't be stamped out or anything like that. They were all hand cut out and laid over this film, right? And it was. Yeah. It was the most. It was the stupidest thing ever, but it paid <laughs> off. Yeah, and that's what. And like everything else, you've just covered. So people need to go and find out just exactly. Um, and it's not a long video. It's like ten minutes, I think. Um, 
But if they want to know just how how much George Lucas pushed the envelope with this movie, go watch how the, the they managed to put. And everyone telling him that there. it would that it would fail, like Steven oh, Spielberg, yeah. one of his best friends. And then it just it blew up. Yeah. So. Um, and now we're gonna get into my number two, which um, so at number two I have The Empire Strikes Back. This movie, in my opinion, is the greatest Star Wars movie objectively. Um, obviously there's one more movie that I like more than this movie, but I mean, this movie is just, in my opinion, like, I think every single human being who's seen this movie would agree that it's probably a top five movie. I mean, everything about this movie is just absolutely fantastic. There's really no flaws, nothing wrong. Um, there, there, I mean, there's rumors that people didn't like it initially when it first came out. I don't know if any of that's true, but I, I mean, this movie is just every the the main you know from from the scene on Hoth, you know, I mean, the whole Wampa scene was only in there just for an excuse to uh, of why Mark Hamill had the scar that he got from yeah, the car crash I was in. But the whole Hoth scene was amazing. You know, you have Vader's you know great entrance. Um, you know, a lot of people could say that's filler, but, you know, every movie has that stuff. And then, you know, when the plot kind of splits into Luke going to Dagobah, you know, because Obi-Wan told him, and then Han, Leia, 3PO, and um, Chewie, you know, they go off on their own way, and they have to go to the asteroid field. I mean, the whole chase when Vader's trying to chase down trying when they and then they end up going to cloud city i mean you know the asteroid theme the asteroid field theme playing yes, you know i mean don't tell me the so odds i mean so many great things happening in that scene and then you know they get to cloud city you introduce us to lando this beautiful i mean the when, I, I remember the first time i found out that it was a painting cloud city all it was was a painting it's, a matte painting. It, yeah. it's, it's like it blew my mind as to how it was a painting because that's how good george lucas made it look i mean then you you know you have them going to cloud city the whole arc with lando and then lando betraying them in a way i mean the scene when the door opens and vader's standing there and and you know being join us it, it, it's just amazing and it's just completely badass and like nobody expected that and then vader you know and then they come in and then han's captured and that whole ending sequence on cloud city and then you know lando says you know we're gonna get out of here and then you know that's that whole one side of the story and I mean, you know, I love Lando as a character too. Introducing him was amazing. And then the stuff that really, I mean, this this is where why people say this is the greatest one of the best movies. I'm in my opinion, time. The reason why all stems from what happens on Dagobah. Luke goes to Dagobah searching for this this wondrous Jedi master that's supposed to be the most, or it's not supposed to be. That is the wisest Jedi that ever lived. And he sees yoda and just can't believe it because yoda's putting on an act trying to test luke and test his patience right from the beginning before he even speaks a word to him yoda's testing luke immediately because he knows his destiny and he knows what luke has to do in order to you know defeat his father and bring peace to the galaxy bring balance to the force whatever you want to call it yoda knows that and he's testing him right from the get-go and everything that goes on on Dagobah, every everything that comes out of Yoda's mouth is just complete wisdom. It's just amazing. I mean, you have him. Uh, you know that that is why you fail. You know, uh, what, what, um, what's in the cave? Only what you take with you. I mean, so many incredible lines that comes out of Yoda's mouth, and just incredible scenes. I mean, the scene where he goes into the cave. I mean, that's some of the greatest symbolism in anything ever. The fact where he duels Vader, um, because. Yoda tells him only what you take with you. He takes his weapons. So he sees his enemy. He sees the person that he's fearful of, the one that he's fighting. And he sees Vader and he chops off his head. And because of that act of anger of killing him, what does he see? Himself, which foreshadows not only him possibly turning to the dark side because of him using his anger, but also foreshadowing the fact that Vader's his father. But in my opinion, the fact that Vader's his father, I think that's secondary to the point where that Yoda is trying to make by going into that cave, you take what you take with you. And it's because him having that fear, that instinctive fear of taking his weapons because he thinks someone's going to try to kill him, that when he goes into that cave full of fear with his weapons, which he shouldn't have taken with, with the weapons that he shouldn't have taken into the cave that what comes out is exactly what he's fearful of. And then when he chops off his head, he is, he sees himself as Vader because that's what he's afraid of is himself 
turning to the dark side. And it's just incredible symbolism and one of the best, you know, one of the best symbolism in all of movies. And then one of my favorite scenes in all of Star Wars, and in my opinion, is the best like musical bit of anything ever, is when he tries to lift off the X Wing. And obviously his training is not complete. He can't do it. And you know, he gives up immediately and he says, you know, there's no way I can do this. Nobody nobody can lift that thing up. And and you know, Yoda just lifts it up in that beautiful moment, which was one of my favorite moments of the Rise of Skywalk. Luke did it to Ray. And the and the John Williams score plays in the background. And and Yoda's lifting up the X Wing and you know the loud crescendo and it just then the apex right as the X Wing comes into the air and drops back down and you see Luke is just sitting there astonished as to as to the power of Yoda. And then Yoda tells him, You can't go, you're not ready. And him and Ben are trying to tell him that he has to complete his training before he goes to fight Vader or else he'll lose. And he knows and he sees his friends that they're gonna die, and he knows that he has to go there. And then the movie ends in failure. I mean, that whole sequence, you know, you are strong with the Force, young Skywalker, but you are not a Jedi yet. And, you know, Luke says, you know, I'm full of surprises because um, – and then Vader, you know, impressive, most impressive. I mean, you just see they're both – you know, they're both shocked. You know, Luke's shocked as to how strong Vader is, and Vader's shocked, shocked as to how strong Luke is. Obviously, Vader knows that Luke is his son. Luke has no idea. Luke Luke is fighting Vader because he's angry because he thinks that he killed his father, which, you know, from a certain point of view, he did. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, everything in this movie, it's just absolutely incredible. All of the, the movie's full of symbolism and just beautiful masterpieces and writing and direction and, and story, plot development, the character development. I mean, every character goes through a complete arc. Han says he's leaving into becoming a general of the, of the, um, rebellion at, at the start of the next movie after he gets broken out in Tatooine but you see you know he starts off he starts off this movie well he starts off this movie as a general technically before he you know he says he's leaving he got his money he's leaving but then in the end he ends up in carbon freeze and you know in the hands of Boba Fett and then you I mean you look at Leia who starts from uh you know who starts from the leader of the rebellion and then ends up just being and he and you know ends up being taken off on the uh, out of Cloud City with Lando, somebody that she's never met before. And then Luke, Luke starts the movie as still basically like a farm boy because I mean he hasn't really accomplished anything other than as a pilot blowing up the Death Star. He hasn't really done much with the Force because he hasn't really been trained. And then he follows his destiny to go be trained by Yoda and be trained in the ways of the Force. And then he ends up with his hand cut off. I mean they all go through these incredible character arcs. And then, of course, I mean the reveal, the the fight on Bespin, and then the reveal of of um, Vader as Luke's father. I mean, I mean, there's nothing, in my opinion, there's just absolutely nothing, nothing bad about this movie. Everything is just so great. And I mean, so yeah, that's all I have to say about Empire Strikes Back. Now, Captain, we'll get into your number one. So, what is your favorite Star Wars movie? Well, it just so happens to be Empire Strikes Back, ah. and. The main reason I think Empire Strikes Back is my favorite movie is just for the sheer amount of storytelling that happens in it. Uh, and like in episode four, we kind of get an introduction to like everything basically. It's like you know, dark side, light side, you know, Obi Wan, Darth Vader, all this kind. Of, we get introduced to everything. Episode five focuses in on a few main points and then forces them. Th- to the ending, which is episode six. Not to mention, we have the greatest line in probably the most greatest and sophisticated, like cheeky line that I have used plenty of times with women, uh, which is the whole <laughs> I love you. Love you I, I know. know. A typical Han. A, t- a very typical Han. And I've used that I know so many times to the point where it's probably my most cliched line to use. Uh, and it works in every situation. Uh, I swear to God, like if you start adapting the use of the word "I know" in specific, it works perfectly. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I love doing it. But also, it gave us two of my, I think, two of my actual number one and number two favorite pieces of music. That's um, Han and Leia's theme, which we get in Cloud City. It's a very beautiful theme. And then, of course, the Asteroid Chase theme, um, which everybody, if I was to say, you know, just give me a little bit of the Asteroid. Chase theme, everybody like, duh, 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 duh. yeah, everyone knows it. It's great. Um, but you know, we also we also get a, a first look at the emperor. It's the first time the emperor's appeared. Um, 
admittedly in the original, kind of a creepy looking hologram dude. And then, of course, yeah. Flesh now we see him really as Ian McDermott. Um, but yeah, there is, there is, there is nothing wrong with this movie. It it's paced exceptionally well. It focuses in on only the main points that we need. That is um, the two stories between the the one group uh, and Luke. Uh, they both they they both disappear off. So they start at the same area. They go on wacky adventures by themselves, but then they end up technically back together, even though they don't see each other that much, apart from Leia shouting, you know. Run, Luke! It's it's a trap, um, and that's like the only time we see him. It it brings them all together to the point where you know. Oh, and then of course when they rescue Luke at the end, um, but yeah, the, the, everybody goes off, and it's like we're jumping a galaxy a little bit, but then everybody's back on the same planet, and it it you know it wipes it up and sets up episode six absolutely perfectly. Plus, and I have wanted this ever since I've watched the movie. Han Solo's goddamn jacket. That that weird dark blue, even though I'm pretty sure it's not dark blue, it's not even blue, I'm pretty sure. It's like a grey that just looks blue on camera, uh, which is, by the way, another uh, special effect trick that they, yeah. they, they realised that they had to do. Um, and that jacket was actually found quite recently, the actual jacket that had so long. Oh, I think I did, yeah, it was bought for like an incredibly, incredible... Oh, God, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I've imagine. wanted that jacket ever since I've seen it. <laughs> Never really wanted the, the the pants that took into the the <laughs> yeah. boots. I've never I never understood that. It's a good look, but that sh- the sh- the shirt. And I don't I don't know if it's just me, but I've kind of adopted this uh, uh, like late seventies, early eighties dress fashion, which I I always have my button open too far. That there's some chest revealed, which is kind of Han Solo's. He's got that little flap. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that jacket, man. That his costume, Leia's costume. Um, the, the, the they're all iconic. There's a lot of iconic, especially Luke's. Before everyone was like, oh yeah, no, Luke wore black. His little pilot costume, not the orange, but the the grey kind of pirate uh, pirate pilot suit he wears in um at the fight of Bespin. Another iconic, and there's a lot of iconic stuff that happens, and it is the best because it's just, it gets down to it. It's straight to the point. It doesn't have to set up anything. It doesn't have to end anything. It can just tell a story, which is what it does. Mm. So it, that's why it's my favorite. All right. And now, um, so we'll get into my number one, the movie that means more to me than anything, any other movie. On the face of the planet, this movie is my favorite movie of all time. Um, not just my favorite Star Wars movie is Star Wars: Return of the Jedi. Um, like I said before, Luke is my favorite humanoid character in uh, the Star Wars saga. Um, and I mean, this movie—I mean, you just right from the get-go, you just see you know the badass Jedi Knight Luke that we all wanted to see. I mean, this is Luke fully trained, knows you know he knows his destiny. He's accepted that Vader is his father. And this is the wise Luke that we didn't get, that we didn't really see in episodes five and four. Episodes five and four, he was still a kid. He was still kind of childish. You know, he was foolish. He made the wrong decisions. Obviously, we see that at the end of episode five when, you know, he gets his hand cut off because of it. I mean, this is a Luke that's accepted the fate that Darth Vader's his father. He knows what he has to do. He knows his destiny. He knows he has to save the galaxy and take down the Empire. Now, I mean, the whole thing, you know, they're, the whole beginning, they're trying to go back to get Han. And, um, you know, the whole beginning scene with Tat- uh, on Tatooine, you know, it opens with 3PO and R2-D2, just as episode four opened with. Um, opens with 3-2 and R2-D2. 3-2 uh, and R2-D2. 3-2. <laughs> that, that'd be a combination of the two of them. 3PO and R2-D2 opens with them going up to Jabba's palace, and you immediately see, I mean, that's just another special effects thing. I mean, you look at how massive the scale of that is. And you just see these two droids and how they like film that and how they did that back in 1983. I mean, that's something that's easily done with the, you know, you and me can probably do that on some on like Photoshop or something. But back then yeah. in 1983, for them to put that up in a movie, I mean, it was just amazing and have that door slide up and open like that. I mean, the whole uh, the whole beginning sequence of the movie is just absolutely incredible. Going on to Tatooine and then the, the whole Jabba's bar scene and then 
just one of the most epic moments in all of Star Wars when Luke hops down towards the Sarlacc pit and then flips himself back up. R2 shoots in the lightsaber and then, you know, the the John Williams theme blares as Luke ignites the lightsaber and then everyone's like, oh, it's green. The only reason it being green was because they can't have the, they didn't have the special effects capability to have the blue lightsaber on a blue sky background when they were filming that scene. But still pretty cool that it was, that's that it's green now. I mean, you just see how you just see how badass and how epic Lucas is his character right from the beginning of the movie. And then that kind of grows as the, you know, then he goes back to uh, Dagobah. You know, he has to see an old friend. He goes back to Dagobah as, you know, just as episode five was where they both split. Luke goes to Dagobah and then the rest of them go to, you know, aid the rebellion and to try to figure out how they can destroy uh, the second Death Star. Now, and then Luke goes back to um, Dagobah and then. Yoda, of course, reveals to him that yes, Vader is his father, and tells him that he has, you know, he has to kill Vader. He has to defeat him. And Luke says, "I can't. I can't kill my own father." And then, and then, um, then you know, right as Yoda's dying, he says, "There is another," which of course we, or there is another Skywalker. And of course, we heard him say that to Obi Wan. Nobody knew who that another was. Then, um, then of course, Obi Wan reveals shortly after as a Force ghost. That is his twin sister, Leia. And of course, Luke knows because he always knows from within that it was Leia. Um, he has a right when Obi-Wan says to him, he says, you know, it's your twin sister. And then Luke thinks and he says, Leia. Um, I mean, just, you know, the power of that, of knowing that they're sisters and then, you know, that Obi-Wan and Yoda are both telling him that he has to go to kill his father. And Luke just says, I can't do it. I can't come father. And then he accepts what he has to do. And then, you know, when they're all down on Endor and then they get captured by uh, the Ewoks, who I, I love the Ewoks. People criticize and say <laughs> it's such a of means. I absolutely love the Ewoks. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's a little weird that they destroyed. I mean, but either way, when you have stormtroopers, you know, when they're getting hit with logs in the head, they're going to get out when people say oh how can ewoks kill them when they're throwing rocks i mean i get it that they have but when they're throwing like massive rocks at them and it knocks them in the neck or something obviously they're going to pass out and you know when they get hit with logs across the head but um so the you know everything on endor is great and then you know when luke goes to endor and then he you know he finds leia and he you know he tells her that you know they're sisters and then leia says you know i've always known and then luke tells her that he, that uh he knows what he has to do. And she says, no, you don't have to. You can run away from here. But he knows, you know, it's his destiny. He knows that he must fulfill the prophecy, something that his father couldn't do. And then that whole scene on Endor when they walk out and, and he's just talking to Vader and, you know, it's in, he says, uh, you know, I know you uh, were at once Anakin Skywalker. And Vader says, and, and Vader says that name means nothing to me anymore. And then he says, it's too late for me, my son. And then that – and you can just see that Luke's not giving up. And then Luke goes to the Emperor. And then – I mean once he gets up in the throne room – start. I mean with Luke, Vader, and the Emperor in the throne room, it, it is my personal favorite – what is it? 45, 30 minutes of movie ever. Roughly, yeah. yeah. I mean you have the space battle going on outside where you know Lando takes the Falcon into the into the Death Star. Han's on en – Han and Leia are on Endor trying to blow up the shield. I mean, it's just so amazing, and you have, um, and you have uh, Luke, you know, going to Luke go confronting the Emperor, and then everything the Emperor says to him, and the tension building up until the, you know, when Luke's about to strike down the Emperor, and his anger overcomes him, and Vader protects his master, and then I mean, that lightsaber battle is just so epic, and you see Luke is refusing. Luke keeps, you know, he keeps throwing the lightsaber away. He says, "I can't do it. You know, I'm not going to fight you, Father." And then once Vader says, "Ooh, sister, if you won't join me, perhaps your sister will." And then that that with him, you know, bringing up Leia, that just completely turns Luke and he channels the dark side and he goes up and just completely obliterates Vader. You know, somebody that we always look, he's so strong that, you know, he couldn't be defeated. And Luke just obliterates him. And then he's, you know, slashing and slashing and slashing and chopping his hand off. And then like we like we were saying before about the symbolism of the Empire Strikes Back, to me, this is just another complete case of it, probably the most you know, again, one of the most symbolism I've ever seen in any movie and certainly in Star Wars is when he cuts off his hand and he looks that it, it symbolizes two things. He looks in his hand and realizes that his father has a mechanical hand just like he does. They're both much more similar than he thought. And also the fact that he cut off his father's hand just as his father did to him, showing that he's becoming his father. He's becoming the thing that he feared to become. He's going down a dark path. And he's going to become 
and, and, you know, if he would have killed, he cuts off his father's hand, just like his father did to him. He's been fulfilling everything that his sister's supposed to fulfill. And using his hate and channeling his anger to, you know, attempt to kill somebody else. And then he looks, you know, he looks at his father and he realizes that he's becoming, he's becoming Darth Vader. He's becoming what he feared to become. And I mean, that symbolism, symbolism is just amazing. And then he throws away the lightsaber and he says, no, I'm a Jedi like my father before me. And then Palpatine just says, so be it. Jedi, and then he starts. Him. Yeah, then he starts just electrocuting Luke, and then Luke says, "Father, father." And then one of the worst special uh, edition additions is, I mean, to me, the silence in that scene of Vader just looking at Luke, looking at the Emperor, looking at Luke, looking at the Emperor, looking at Luke, looking at the Emperor, and then once again, like we were saying, now, now here's Anakin. This is Anakin. This isn't Vader anymore. This is Anakin Skywalker. And Anakin Skywalker's best quality and his worst quality is 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 his love, and his love for his son overcomes him. And he picks up his master, and you know now they have him saying, no. "No, no!" But the silence was just so much more powerful and impactful. And he and he lifts up the emperor and throws him off the ledge to his death because he did technically die. Because Palpatine says in the Rise of Skywalker, "I have died before," confirming that he died and is somehow back to life in whatever form. But we won't know that until we, we won't know that. Yeah, we won't know that until we. Uh, get a book about it which will probably be you know the main the main character will be that uh the, the you know the guy who the actor from the hobbit plays in the rise of skywalker um so and then just that whole you know he tossed him off and then you know anakin skywalker's would please please saga is back <laughs> please and rephrase then, that what he tosses him off oh oh yeah <laughs> he tosses him <laughs> off the ledge to his death and then um so, and then, you know, when the, the Death Star is obviously about to blow up and Luke knows that he has to get him off there. And what I also find kind of um, comical is the fact that you see you see Luke, who's obviously not supposed to be on the Death Star, dragging like Darth Vader, like laying on the ground, like completely powerless. And all these stormtroopers are just like running by, like having, having like completely not even realizing that, oh, my God, why is Darth Vader being dragged across the floor by this like random kid that we don't even know who it is? Um, and then, you know, and then just the powerful moment between Luke and his father. And he says, you know, let me cast my, cast my eyes upon you, my son, like with my own eyes, take off this mask. And then he takes off the mask and then, you know, Vader dies. And then Luke flies off, um, Luke flies off the Death Star and then it blows up. And then Han's like, I'm sure Luke was off there. And then Leia's like, I know he, I know he would feel it. And then Han's like, oh, okay. I don't want to get in the way of this. And then Leia says, no, 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 he's my brother. Yeah, and, that, and then we get the just, best yeah, look ever. Yeah, the best look, because, you know, Han's thinking, holy shit, you kissed him. But then he's also <laughs> thinking, like, wow, now I have a wife, because, you know, obviously that's setting up for them to get married one day, which, of course, eventually happens. And then, um, yeah, I mean, you know, just how the movie wraps up, and then Luke burning Vader, uh, burning, you know, burning Vader's armor. And then, you know, Anakin becoming one with the Force. I mean, it's just, it's incredible symbolism. It's just incredibly powerful. Wraps up the, wraps up that trilogy and wrapped up the saga up and, you know, from episodes one through six. And then, you know, my, you know, another of my favorite scenes in all of Star Wars, just Luke looking out and seeing Obi-Wan, Yoda, and his father, Anakin. And, you know, that's how the movie ends. Yep. And it's just my, you know, it's just my favorite, favorite movie of all time. And I just absolutely love everything about it. There's no flaws in my opinion. People can say stuff about the Ewoks. I don't care. A lot of people say they don't like Return of the Jedi. I don't know how nobody – I don't know how people don't like it. I can get if it's not people's favorite. But, I mean, in my opinion, for everybody, it should be – you know, in a greatest ranking, it should be in the top five. And I don't really I – don't really, it may be biased, but I don't personally think it's biased because even though I love this movie and it's my favorite movie of all time, I think it's just objectively amazing, objectively great. And uh, yeah, so with that, that wraps up our ranking of the Star Wars movies. So, um, Captain, I had a lot of fun with this video. I'm sure you did too. We finally, oh, you know, we got to express our opinions about the saga as a whole and about each individual movie. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this podcast up right now because this was uh, certainly a long episode and we uh we have to run here. But um, yeah, so uh, next week we will be bringing you guys a preview of. Clone Wars season seven. So we'll be diving into um the two trailers that we've got. The one that we got back at D23, and when was that? February 2019, I think, whenever that was, whenever D23 was. Um 
the the trailer that we got. The, oh no, it was released at Comic Con in February 2019. My mistake. Um, Kenobi was re- was released at D23 in like August or whatever. But um, you know, we'll we'll look at that trailer and then we'll look at the most recent trailer we got that you know shows off the Maul and Ahsoka fight at the end. I mean, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the Clone Wars season seven a lot. I'm sure Captain, you are too. And okay. um. And it's definitely going to be, you know, it's going to give us a lot of Star Wars content to cover. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the video, we're hoping to bring you guys weekly reviews of every single episode. We'll have another topic to go along with that, but, you know, each episode will, for the next, until the end of Clone Wars Season 7, we'll have a review of the latest uh, episode. And then, you know, we'll dive into another Star Wars topic, whatever we have that's popular at, uh, at that time. And um, so, yeah, so uh, just to quickly, I'm just going to quickly read out um, our list. So Captain's List, uh, 11, he had The Last Jedi. At 10, he had The Rise of Skywalker. At 9, he had The Force Awakens. 8, The Phantom Menace. Uh, 7, Attack of the Clones. 6, Rogue One. 5, Revenge of the Sith. 4, Solo, A Star Wars Story. Um, 3, Return of the Jedi. 4, A New Hope. Uh, 2, Episode 4, A New Hope. And then number 1, The Empire Strikes Back. And my list... Um, uh the la- the worst number 11 the last jedi uh followed at number 10 by rogue one a star wars story number nine episode seven the force awakens number eight episode two attack of the clones number seven episode one the phantom menace number six episode nine the rise of skywalker uh number five episode three revenge of the sith number four solo a star wars story uh, number three, episode four, A New Hope. Number two, episode five, The Empire Strikes Back. And number one, episode six, The Return Return of the Jedi. All right. So thank you guys for tuning in. And um, we will see you next week. Goodbye. Toodles.